Namaskar. Uh, welcome to all. Uh, the meeting is live now. We formally begin the second day of this international symposium on Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, developmental dynamics and future trajectories, jointly organized by Embassy of India, Seoul, and Yonsei University in Republic of Korea, along with Indian Council for Cultural Relations and the India Foundation, uh, along with uh, the Jammu uh, Kashmir Study Center in India. We've seen uh, the wonderful uh, beginning of the session yesterday by uh, the uh, speech of uh, Sri Radha Krishna Mathur, Honorable Lieutenant Governor of the UT of Ladakh, which was um, followed by two uh, brainstorming sessions focusing on uh, the historical uh, significance uh, uh, where the speakers focused on uh, the developmental process and the historical um, uh, historicity. Uh, along with that, we had a session on internal security uh, Today, uh, we are back with you uh, with three back-to-back uh, -back brainstorming sessions focusing on unique socio-cultural ethos. The next session after this will focus on the new growth and developmental models, followed by another session on gender equity and social justice. And uh, let us now... Uh, uh, quickly begin with the first session, uh, which is uh, now uh, focusing on unique socio-cultural ethos. For this, uh, may I now call upon Major General Dhruv Katoch, who is the Director of India Foundation, to preside over the session. Uh, over to you, um, Major General uh, Dhruv Katoch. Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, namaskar, and a very good morning to all of you. Uh, we now begin the first session of today's program, which is focused on uh, developmental models and the unique social cultural ethos. Uh, this is in continuation with the excellent presentations given yesterday, which looked into matters of historical significance and also on the evolving internal security dynamics and challenges. Uh, today, we shift focus slightly to the people of Jammu and Kashmir and towards economic issues uh, which will be covered in this particular session. And to speak on the subject, we have two very distinguished speakers. I'll introduce both of them right now only. Ms. Priti Kark has been working in the field of journalism for over a decade, where she covers an intersection of politics and governance. She was earlier associated with the Hindu and now is a journalist with the Hindustan Times, two of the premier newspapers of India. She will give us an insight into perceptions of different communities on development in Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. The second speaker, again, a very distinguished speaker is Professor Du Won Lee. He is a professor in the School of Economics, Yonsei University, Seoul. Currently, he is a director at the Institute of Continuing Education for the Future at Yonsei University. He has a very distinguished career profile, having acquired his PhD in economics from Northwestern University in 1991, and thereafter tenanted many appointments in the academic field in Korea 
and across the world. A prolific writer, he has contributed roughly 190 columns to domestic and international newspapers. His area of interest lies in international economics, transition economics, and economics of development. He shall speak to us on the implication of Korean economic development experience for India. Now, uh, each of the speakers will have about 20 odd minutes or so to uh, speak, uh, which will really give us uh, anything between 10 to 15 minutes for an interactive section uh, thereafter. So without wasting much time, may I now request uh, Ms. Smriti Kark to begin her presentation, please. Over to you, Smriti. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, um, good morning to all of you. And I'm uh, really happy that I, I've been able to join this uh, conference. Um, I'd like to begin with a disclaimer that my views on how different uh, communities perceive uh, the status of Jammu and Kashmir pre and post uh, reading down of Article 370 are my own, and they cannot be attributed to my employer. Uh, having said that, uh, to begin with, and I think it's uh, something that we, that needs to be said over and over again, uh, you know, to, to underline the fact that uh, there has been, uh, uh, you know, over the years, there has been a perception that uh, Article 370 and subsequently Article 35A, they were preconditions to Kashmir's accession to India. Uh, there is no historical evidence to suggest this. And... Uh, you know, people who've been in the know of things have repeatedly said it, but this perception kept on building that there was some kind of tacit support or tacit understanding between uh, the leaders at that time that by signing the accession uh, instrument of accession, uh, Kashmir would be uh, extended certain special provisions. Uh, the instrument of accession that was signed by the then Maharaja, Maharaja Hari Singh, a document which is similar to uh, any other that was signed by the other princely states. Uh, there was nothing in the document to uh, certify that uh, Kashmir would be treated differently from the other states. Uh, what happened much later was, uh, you know, Article 35A, for instance, that um, laid down the specific conditions for domicile or residential rules in the in the sense that that specify the laws that specify that who, um, you know, sort of uh, is eligible to be called a permanent citizen of the state was subsequently incorporated in 1954. And these were temporary provisions that came uh, through a presidential decree. Uh, what has happened over the years is uh, also a narrative was built, uh, especially by those people who have been uh, pro these articles, that these were some kind of a bridge between the people of Jammu and Kashmir and mainland India, that uh, the relationship between a state and uh, you know the, the federal structure was so designed that if these uh, rules of uh, sorry if these provisions were to be nullified or taken away it would lead to some kind of a catastrophic uh, you know unfolding or that people in the state would you know find themselves more alienated than they do uh, as, as on date but um, there has been a significant uh, you know sort of um, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of, I, I would say that, you know, voices that have been in uh, favor of these provisions have been so loud, they have literally drowned out every other voice that had, um, you know, raised some kind of concerns about these provisions, uh, about how these provisions have uh, denied the rights to certain sections, uh, particularly the minorities in that state. So uh, whatever their uh, concerns were about the provision uh, of these uh, about these provisions, have been um, largely they've largely gone unheard. Also because you know numerically these communities were not very large, uh, politically they were not very empowered, and you could say it was some kind of a willful design in trying to uh, not hear these voices who gave the other side of the story. Uh, now coming to uh, the communities that have by and large, that are expected to by and large uh, benefit from the removal of Article 370 and 35A are people who are on the margins. These are people who have been economically, socially, educationally, uh, you know, sort of disempowered. They're, they're, they, they're not, uh, you know, their voices are, do not sort of resonate in the mainstream. Uh, these communities, uh, essentially the pastoral communities in Jammu and Kashmir, who are known as the Gujars and the Bakarwals, 
they make up for about 12% of the state's population, yet they did not find themselves politically empowered. These are communities that all political parties um, you know, tried to woo, but when it came to uh, extending them the same rights as uh, you know, the other sections, the mainstream sections, that, that remained, lip, you know, that, that was just, that remained on paper. So for the first time, uh, these pastoral communities, which come under the larger ambit of scheduled tribes in India, they can look forward to political representation because as for the new law, uh, the Jammu have for the first time seats reserved for them in the assembly of the state. So whenever elections are going to be held in the state next, these people can look forward to some seats being reserved uh, particularly for them. Um, the scheduled castes uh, who are extended similar benefits uh, did benefit from uh, provisions in the state, but the tribes largely went uh, ignored. Uh, then uh, the scheduled tribes, uh, because a lot of them also live in forest areas, uh, they, they they did not have certain provisions that the counterparts in other states had. Uh, India has a set of uh, forest uh, laws, you know, that govern the rights of those people who live in, uh, uh, you know, forest areas. They have a certain right to the forest produce. So every now and then the government revisits the policy to find out if these people are economically and socially uh, sort of, uh, you know, given, given benefits that, that would help them uh, sort of improve their lot. So similar kind of uh, uh, benefits are now going to be extended to the ST uh, community people in the state. The other community that uh, completely, you know, uh, sort of uh, was, uh, uh, that faced the brunt of these uh, particular provisions is, um, is, a, is a constituency which has emerged as one with a lot of political heft in, in recent times. And this is the constituency uh, of women. Uh, now, if you look at um, India's, if you look at the polity of how India has, uh, how it has shaped and how our election processes have been, you realize that every political party in every state has been conscious of the fact that the power of the woman vote. Consequently, uh, there have been these, there have been all kinds of interventions made uh, to ensure that, you know, the women's voices are heard and they're treated as equal citizens. However, in JNK, this did not apply. I mean, uh, there was a lot said about women's empowerment and equality, etc. But this was, uh, again, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the much wasn't done. Denied women the agency to pick their own partners because the law, as it stood earlier, did uh, it literally forced. women to give up their inheritance rightfully theirs. When the provision was challenged and rules were relaxed to extent that women could themselves sell a property, but they could not pass it on to their children or share it with their spouses. So this gender disparity, which should have been uh, a red flag to any political party, any social organization that talks about gender equity, equality, largely went, uh, you know, sort of, it was ignored again in the state. Um, it's, it's, it's actually frightful how uh, this, this discrimination was allowed on for had at least one chief minister. None of the political parties found it, uh, you know, relevant to raise the issue. Uh, every time somebody, uh, you know, there was a lot of obfuscation as far as this one particular issue was concerned. Then uh, there's, the fact that uh, people from outside JNK were barred from purchasing land uh, in the state uh, came with its own set of problems. Uh, you know, you could argue uh, to kingdom come that there are these are certain provisions that are in, in the border areas or have a very fragile economic, uh, sorry, uh, ecology. So um, those kind of you know, it's so th th this kind of provision was some kind of a check and balance against rampant, rampant, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, development, uh, indus industrialization, etc. But there are norms to check that as well. The fact that you basically.
basically barred anybody from purchasing big businesses coming and setting up you know industries in kashmir uh, you didn't uh, you know the kind of the scale at which you have, have private universities uh, you know multi speciality hospitals um, all kinds of other industry that doesn't necessarily threaten environment in other states are largely conspicuously missing from kashmir which in turn also uh, you know sort of impacts um, employment in the state for example because then the people are complained on the government for jobs then uh, your economic opportunity is restricted to certain sectors as it is in kashmir uh, which is primarily tourism to some extent um, uh, agriculture and uh, apart from this there was there was um, another set of new laws are drafted or the existing ones amended to uh, to you know to address whatever concerns are there on the ground whether it's about healthcare education etc but every time a new law was passed by indian parliament they had to go through a long drawn process of uh, trying to see how this could also be extended to jammu and kashmir um so with with the reading down of article 370 uh, that bit has become easier Uh, because now a set of law that ensures that even if a small percentage were to violate that law there's going to be a uh, uh, punishment or there's going there's going to be reparation for that similarly uh, the law against domestic violence again women suffered uh, on this front as well there since there was no law that barred uh, you know sort of that that sort of gave protection to women um, the state did have its own mechanism a little uh, but again not very not very uh, what tight um uh, similarly there are there are other provisions uh, other laws for instance manual scavenging has been banned in india for uh, many years now though of course it's not been implemented 100% on the ground because of certain uh, you know there is always somebody who finds a way to nearly non existent so there is a whole lot of people who are, whole section of people who are going to be now protected because um the certain law is now applicable to the state as well um you know overall if one small groups of people who have not been whose concerns have not been heard for for years together there are people who's who've been promised a better life people like uh, uh, the refugees who came from west pakistan um who had the right to vote in the general elections but could not do so in the state uh, um these people who had been promised government jobs who had been promised uh, you know a, a better life but continue to uh, you know sort of flounder because there was a general sense of apathy political parties and governments over the years um, you know of course they raised the issues but nothing was really done so um we were also aware of the fact that because of the uh, the, the drudgery of having to live in a place which did not recognize recognize you as a permanent citizen which denied you access to jobs even if you had education um it was all very hard on these people um i am aware of at least uh, having read in the papers about how some of these people to escape this uh, drudgery to escape this uh, willful negligence had sometimes to uh, you know take uh, take to unlawful methods of uh, finding themselves uh, you know um, uh, avenues of getting onto the voters list because that in, in turn ensures that you at least have access to jobs and education so uh, these are the class of uh, different sections of people who are largely uh, going to benefit uh, with with a changed scenario um the other uh, set of people in uh, in the erstwhile state who have uh, who you know who who are going to be benefited are people living in ladakh now of the three regions that made up the erstwhile state ladak is uh, the most expansive in terms of territory of course it has uh, uh, you know a far uh, smaller population as compared to the valley and jammu uh, regions but um, this kind this uh, what what eventually happened was that because our uh, political constituencies are drawn on the basis of uh, area plus population because ladak did not have a sizable population or a 
population comparative to uh, the Jammu and the Kashmir Valley regions, um, they again were politically not empowered. I mean, their representation in the state assembly, in the Lok Sabha uh, was, was very low. So this in turn um, sort of, it was, a, it was a major grouse of the people that they had been overlooked over the years. Development in this region has been particularly slow. Uh, it's only now in 2020 that the state has got its first central university. If you look at uh, uh, you know, uh, the indices of health and education uh, in Ladakh vis-a-vis Kashmir, um, and compared it to the rest of the country, you'll realize that while Kashmir actually has uh, you know, scores better than a lot of other states in terms of um, education and healthcare uh, indices, uh, Ladakh, on the other hand, has been, uh, you know, the, the, the figures are abysmally low. So this kind of uh, overall apathy that was shown to the region has, um, it's, uh, it's unjust to the people. So um, now that Ladakh is a separate union territory altogether, people are hopeful that um, the monies that were allocated from the center and rooted to it through Kashmir um, would come to them directly, which means people will have more control over what to spend and where uh, development would be faster because you know there is um, uh, there is no rerouting of files and paperwork and uh, you know the typical bureaucratic red tape. Uh, so again, um, uh, these are the, these are people who are going to largely benefit from uh, the uh, reading down of Article 370. And like I said before, these are people uh, whose concerns have. Uh, you know, they have barely ever been sort of given the same kind of uh, attention as the voices from the mainland in Kashmir, uh, because, like I said, the numbers are fewer, they are not politically empowered. Um, this uh, uh, largely sums up what I wanted to say about uh, the sections who are going to benefit from this. And um, having said that, uh, uh, even today, the, even today when uh, things have changed on the ground, uh, the state has been bifurcated into two union territories. The concerns that people have, the people who are in support of, uh, you know, continuing with uh, the old provisions that gave the state its so-called special status, um, their uh, concerns about alienation of people, their concerns about their worries about a possible change in demography of the state. Um, this is uh, largely based on rhetoric than any um, hard evidence to suggest that anything, uh, you know, any of these fears are actually going to be uh, coming true because um, the fact that, you know, people from uh, who are non-domiciled residents of JNK can actually look forward to buying property in JNK or settling there, um, these, these are in the realm of possibilities. It's, uh, there is no such uh, evidence or there is no such... Uh, uh, you know, indication that en masse people are going to be migrating to Kashmir and changing the demography of the place or the natives are going to be thrown out of jobs or uh, whatever businesses they own. So uh, those are fairs that need to be addressed. Those are issues that need to be sort of tackled head on um, because uh, as with a lot of other things in JNK, uh, certain narratives uh, tend to become uh, the gospel truth over a period of time. Uh, with that, I wrap up and um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, over to you, Mr. Katoj. Um, thank you, Smriti. Uh, I think that was a very powerful, um, uh, a very powerful talk, giving out exactly uh, uh, the concerns uh, which existed due to the uh, prevalence of Article 370 and 35A. Uh, there are just two points I wish to uh, uh, further highlight. Uh, in my view, I think it is a classic e example which was in a majority in a few districts, managed to control the narrative for the whole state of Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, in the process, they neglected and ignored a very large segment of the population. That is one. Uh, I'm glad at least that is now history. The second point, I think, uh, which merits a great deal of consideration is not so much 3370 as 35A and the manner in which it was inserted into the constitution. So when this particular article went into the constitution in 1954, as mentioned by uh, Smriti ji, it did not go through parliament. And this is the only po portion of the Indian constitution which has actually come into the statute books without going through parliament. And I think that was, uh, in my personal view, uh, a fraud committed on the Indian constitution. Uh, moreover, 
in all the const in all the books published of the Constitution of India, 35A actually does not find a mention. Anyway, having said that, now uh, we move on to our next speaker. Uh, may I now invite Professor uh, Du Wan Lee um, to give your presentation? Professor, all yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, before I present my paper, uh, I want to let you know that uh, I wrote this paper to compare Korea and India's economy. I did not particularly have uh, Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh reason in my consideration, but I do hope that my paper would give some implication that can be applied only to this region of India. And I have to share my file. Uh, am I allowed to share my file? Yes, Professor, you can uh, share. Please, please share your file. Thank you. Can everyone look at it? Oh uh, yeah, it's visible. Thank you. So it's the implication of Korea's economic development experience for Korea. Basically, I wanted to compare Korea's past to India's present and try to compare its similarities and differences as well. And then finally try to draw some implications. Actually, uh, I have uh, started to compare Korea and India uh, as early as 2004 when I joined a symposium organized by Yonsei University and uh, Observer Research Foundation of India. I'm, I'm very happy to continue my study on Korea and India's relationship. So this is the general of outline of my presentations. Uh, before I compare Korea and India, let's take a look at Korea's uh, record of rapid growth from 1962 all the way to 2014. I compared six major developing countries of each continent, including Korea and India. As of 1965, Korea was actually at the poorest out of these six developing countries uh, with its GDP per capita, uh, only about $106 at the time. And India's GDP per capita at the time was slightly over $110. But you know, after Korea started to have rapid economic growth, uh, Korea soon outperformed other developing countries. And since the early 2000s, uh, Korea is designated as high income country by almost every multinational institutions. The so-called rapid growth era of Korea started from 1963 and it continued until 1991. And I, and I believe that India also uh, is experiencing similar transformation uh, these days. So now let me continue to compare Korea and India. We all know that India actually uh, started becoming reform, such as deregulations and liberalization a little bit you know, later in the 20th century. So uh, I tried to compare Korea and India in the past from the early 1960s to 1980. You know, when you compare two different countries, you have to bear in mind, we do have a price difference between two different countries. So that's why instead of using the nominal income, I used income measured at TPP, purchasing power parity. And also uh, to have a meaningful comparison between today and the past, you have to adjust the income uh, with inflation. It means that you have to take a look at the real GDP, not the nominal GDP. So, um, uh, I mean, unfortunately, uh, uh, I could get this data from Pan World Table database. So this is real GDP per capita measured at purchasing power parity from 1961. Take a look at the number in 1961. Actually, both Korea and India data is fairly similar with each other, almost uh, same. But then 
Korea experienced rapid economic growth from 1963 as Korea shifted economic policy from inward import substitution policy to outward export oriented policies. And then the income gap between Korea and India has become larger and larger. When India's real income virtually stagnant for almost 20 years, uh, Korea's real income started to soar. But that's the story before India initiated the economic reform. Uh, but after India introduced economic changes in 1980s and economic reform in the early 1990s, India has also experienced rapid economic growth. So as of today, in the real GDP per capita of India, in 2019 is approximately uh, 6,600 uh, US dollar at 2017 price level. Uh, by the way, I have to apologize that there is a, a fairly serious mistake in this graph. Actually, the red line represents Korea's real GDP per capita, and the blue line represents India's real GDP per capita. So uh, please uh, change my presentation material. But anyway, uh, having said that, I tried to find out the year when Korea's real GDP per capita would be similar to India's 2019 real GDP per capita. And I found that Korea's real GDP per capita in 1983 was similar to India's real GDP per capita of 2019. So it implies that India's economy today in terms of real income is similar to Korea's economy in the middle of 1980s. So now I take a look at the economic structure. Uh, this is a little bit outdated even though I use more updated data, still I find I, I, I can reach the same conclusion. India today, as of 2019, has a similar economic structure to Korea in the middle of the 1980s, especially, especially in terms of the share of agricultural sector and the service sector. In the middle of the 1980s, Korea's share of agriculture output out of the total GDP was roughly 14 or 15%. And the India's share of agriculture today is at a similar level. Of course, uh, Korea had slightly higher proportion of manufacturing sector in the middle of the 1980s. However, uh, basically speaking, uh, out of this agriculture, industry, and service structure. In Korea's middle of 1980s data was very much similar to India's data of today. So I can say that both in terms of real income per capita and also in terms of the industrial structure, India today is similar to Korea in the middle of 1980s. So from now on, I will try to compare Korea's economy in the middle of the 1980s and India's economy today. And as I told you previously, Korea had rapid economic growth era from 1963 to 1991 for almost 30 years. And during those 30 years, the average real GDP growth was 9.7% every year. That was a record number uh, among all those uh, developing countries in the 20th century. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this record had been broken by China because China experienced rapid growth error for more than 35 years. But anyway, as India's today is similar to Korea's 
economy in the middle of the 1980s, I will try to figure out what would be the major factors behind this rapid economic growth in the, 19, in the middle of the 1980s in Korea. And of course, after I figure out these factors, then I will try to compare it to India today. So what made this rapid economic growth of Korea possible, especially in the middle of the 1980s? I tried to explain these uh, questions with two different approach. The first approach is to use neoclassical growth model. This is a purely economical uh, theory, economical uh, model that try to explain the growth performance of a certain country. In order to have economic growth, you have to create more value. You have to keep on creating value as it. And in order to create more values and more outputs, you have to increase production factors, right? You have to inject more production factors into your economy so that you can create more output. And basically there are three production factors, labor, capital, and technologies. So neo neoclassical growth model is explaining economic growth by looking at the production factors such as labor, capital, and technologies. They basically assume that labor, capital, and technologies will be assembled in the market by the market forces, and they will create more values. So let me take a look at these three production factors of Korea when Korea was in the rapid economic growth. The first factor would be capital. In order to increase capital, you have to invest, right? Only when you invest, you can increase the capital stock. But in order to invest, you have to have high saving. So let me take a look at the gross saving rate and the gross investment rate of Korea during the rapid economic growth era. Uh, this is saving rate and investment rate of Korea in the 1970s all the way to 2000s. As you can see, Korea had relatively high investment ratio all the time, somewhere between 30% and even 40% of the GDP. And what enabled this high investment ratio was relatively high saving rate. You know, uh, sometimes, something like the uh, 1970s, Korea's saving rate was slightly, you know, uh, shorter than Korea's investment rate. However, generally speaking, Korea has maintained both high saving ratio and high investment ratio. Let me compare Korea's saving and investment to other developing countries. Uh, this is data uh, from 1980 to 1991. That was the time when Korea was experiencing uh, rapid economic growth. And then I try to compare it to India. So uh, India's data was introduced here, but uh, India's time period would be the past 10 years. Take a look at this data. First of all, uh, take a look at the investment ratio. Well, uh, Korea's investment ratio is generally speaking higher than the other developing countries. However, it is very similar to Malaysia and also similar to India of today. So high investment alone cannot explain high growth. Take a look at the growth ratio, the annual growth ratio. With a similar investment rate, Korea maintained 9% economic growth, but Malaysia 6% and India about 7%. It means that Korea has made relatively more efficient investment because you know, uh, Korea has achieved higher growth 
even though Korea invested similar amount of uh, investment out of its GDP. Another thing you need to take a look at this table is the gap in saving rate and investment rate. Relatively speaking, when Korea had high economic growth, the gap between saving and investment is negligible. However, take a look at the gap for a country like Malaysia and Mexico, for example. Uh, let's see if we have larger saving investment gap. If you have larger saving and investment gap, it means that you have to depend on foreign capital, foreign capital to fuel your investment. Well, uh, I think uh, that's the comp first comparison between Korea and other developing countries in terms of investment and capital accumulations. And now let's take a look at the second production factor, which is labor. You know, every developing country in terms of labor has similarities to each other because developing countries by its nature has cheap and abundant labor forces. Almost every developing country, especially developing country in Asia, they have cheap laborers and they have abundant number of laborers. That would be true for India today, and that was true for Korea in the middle of the 1980s. But the key difference of labor forces in the case of Korea in the middle of the 1980s was the quality of labor. Even though Korea's labor was cheap and abundant, in terms of its human capital quality, uh, it was much superior to the other developing countries. This table shows the education level of Korea and other countries in 1965. In 1965, Korea was not even a middle-income country. Korea was low-income country. But take a look at this education enrollment data. Korea's educational level is actually very similar to Chile. But Chile's income at the time was seven times higher than Korea's. So it explains that even when Korea had very, very low income, Korea's educational level was substantially higher than the other developing countries. Compare Korea to India in 1965. You can find two big differences. One is primary school enrollment. Korea had 100% enrollment ratio for primary school. India, 74%. It means that about one quarter of Indian young population simply cannot read and write in 1965. If you cannot graduate from elementary school, it's difficult to do read and writing and do simple you know, mathematics. In terms of social school, however, we have similar data for Korea and India. Another difference can be found in the secondary school, you know, basically middle school and high school. Uh, you can see that Korea has substantially higher number than India. How about 1983? Well, uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I told you that uh, India today is similar to Korea in the middle of the 1980s. So let's take a look at Korea and India in the middle of the 1980s. Uh, this time, uh, another uh, big difference, especially in terms of secondary school enrollment. In 1983, India's secondary school enrollment ratio is lagging substantially behind Korea. Uh, by, by 2019, India had caught up with Korea, but still we do have meaningful difference in terms of secondary school enrollment. Another difference is, can be found in terms of government expenditure for each level of education. Uh, take a look at India today. 
Well, uh, India's government is spending relatively large amount of money for tertiary school student. If you look at India's data in 2013, uh, spending per student for college level is two times or three times higher than secondary school or primary school, which is not exactly the case in Korea. It's actually the, the opposite case in Korea. Korean government is spending more money on primary school students than secondary school students, leaving the college students' education basically to private institutions. So this can be a meaningful difference between Korea and India in terms of the labor factors or education. It means that India is spending more money for college education. And relatively speaking, uh, the uh, educational enrollment in the, in the secondary school is lagging behind. But this can cause a serious problem because when you spend a lot of resources on college, you can create a lot of you know, talented uh, engineers and managers. But when you do not spend resources for secondary school, it means that you do not have good competence. You know, uh, with what, what if uh, you have you know, smart engineers and architecture who can design fairly nice buildings, but what happens if you do not have good competence who can actually have all those skills to build those uh, buildings? You are in trouble. Well, the third factor is technology. Technology can be measured uh, by TFP, total factor productivity. Uh, I don't have time to explain how we can measure it, but uh, believe me, this is a very common way to measure technological progress in economics. Uh, I compared nine, from 1990 to 2013. Once again, uh, the average growth rate of GDP and growth rate of TFP. Well, in this, India's performance is not bad. Growth rate is very, very good with average uh, annual growth rate of 6%. And out of 6%, 1.6% came from technological progress, which is uh, pretty uh, high compared to the other developing countries. So it means that uh, India today depends on productivities for its growth compared to the other developing countries. And this is a good sign. I think it is because of India's uh, economic structure. As you know, India has a very strong ICT industry and very strong uh, biological industries. And these kinds of high-tech industries create uh, more values and definitely uh, they are leading productivity progress and technological progress. The other, the final sector, uh, the, the, uh, I mean, the other approach that, that I employed to explain economic growth is the role of the government and industrial policy. You know, uh, the first approach basically uh, rely on market forces. However, we all know that developing countries cannot rely on market forces alone. We need fairly active and very uh, effective role of the government. Basically, uh, during the Korea's rapid growth era, it was government-led industrialization. Government provided a lot of guidelines, but the size of government was relatively small. When you measure the size of the, size of the government by looking at government expenditure out of GDP, Korea's government was relatively small, but they were fairly authorit authoritative and they, they had a fairly effective uh, industrial policy. And they had fairly competent bureaucracy. You know, setting up policy is relatively easy. Setting up good policy 
also can be done with good you know, policymakers. However, the more difficult thing is how to implement those policies. And in order to implement, you need fairly effective bureaucratic system. And in terms of this bureaucratic system, Korea had advantage. And Korea's industrial policy was always, almost always fairly market friendly. It means that when Korea's government tried to implement industrial policy, they relied on private enterprise. This can be a big difference between Korea and other developing countries. Many other developing countries, they rely on state-owned enterprise in order to promote a new industry. For example, automobile industry. When Korean government tried to promote automobile industry, Korean government provided policy guidelines, Korean government provided infrastructure and incentives, but who did the main action? It was private companies. Private companies such as Hyundai Motors, Kia Motors, Daewoo Motors, they were the main actor. They invested and they penetrated into foreign market. They innovated. They were leading the market. So it was basically a private sector who was in charge of production and investment. That's probably the biggest difference. Another difference is that Korean government introduced competition. Even though it has government-led in the industrialization, government kept on providing competition, both domestic competition and international competition. And this competition made Korean companies to be more efficient and productive. And another big difference is that uh, from the very beginning, many of these industries were export-oriented. From the very beginning, when Korean government promote a certain industry, they try to promote this industry to be major export industry in the future. Of course, they cannot export you know, uh, overnight, but once they are matured enough, then Korean government lifted the protection and let them compete in international market. So these kinds of difference can explain why Korean government industrial policy succeeded in most of the cases in the middle of the 1980s when uh, many other developing countries industrial policies did not. Uh, professor, may I uh, this, to, uh, Professor, yeah, may I, I think this is the last uh, slide. Yeah. Right, okay. This is slide just shows that, uh, shows my uh, last point that Korea's government at rel relatively small size and co government budget was well balanced. Okay, I will stop here. The remaining slide on mine just summarize what I just mentioned. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I think that was very cogently brought out. And uh, what struck me really um, amongst the many points which you have given, uh, one which really struck was really the way uh, education has been handled differently in Korea and India, where Korea laid emphasis on primary education and India actually laid emphasis uh, uh, on the higher education. And that has created uh, um, uh, its own dynamics in a way. Uh, I think one of our, some of the problems that we have really faced is, uh, and we still continue to face, is on the regulatory frameworks, our labor laws, our ease of doing business, uh, where the bureaucracy is actually um, a very, very um, overbearing uh, and in a legal dispute redressal mechanisms. Um, I think this was an absolutely brilliant talk and thank you so much. Uh, now, we, um, now we throw open uh, the, uh, 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 the conversation to uh, the interactive session. And uh, we have two questions here. Uh, may I request the director if uh, somebody could read them out? Sono? Yes. Uh, uh, the first question, which is in Korean, uh, actually says that uh, the participant was not able to uh, uh, join yesterday. So he's just greeting. So we can just ignore that. The second question is uh, why having a property should be a concern or should be tackled? Again, same discrimination line is raised. 
Haven't the changes made through removing 35A aims to treat uh, JNK and Ladakh region same as other states? And you, this is a long question. Probably, I think uh, Ms. Smriti can answer this. Um, yeah. Uh, Priti, over to I'm you. Sorry, I didn't get the question. The question really. Uh, Smriti, I'll just uh, I'll just repeat it for you. Uh, what uh, Vaishnavi Singh is stating is why having property should be a concern, or sh uh, uh, yeah, why having property should be a concern or should be tackled. Uh, what what uh, is is being referred to is the same discrimination is again being raised, and having the changes made through through removing 35A which aims to treat the uh, JNK and Ladakh region same, um, hasn't that been nullified if you're going to have these property laws? That is the essence of what is being said. Over to you. So essentially, yes, because after the uh, rules have been changed, uh, women can now you know, sort of inherit what is legally and rightfully theirs, and then also pass it on to their children and their spouses. So this, this was you know, totally discriminatory that women could not choose their partners. They would uh, sort of, you know, they were forbidden from sort of exercising the right to uh, marry who they wish to, because, uh, you know, uh, as per the old unaltered law, they literally forfeit their rights. So this is discrimination. I mean, and why should um, having property not be an issue? Because, you know, women are, uh, you um, know, the... Yes, Priti Mayan. No, I don't think that was the intent. Uh, the, that uh, ha women having rights is totally taken. I think what the what the, uh, the what the question is is um, for the rest of India buying property within Jammu and Kashmir now. I think that is the thrust of the question, not within Kashmir. Uh, yeah. So yes, I mean now people can. I mean, barring agricultural land or forest land, people can look forward to buying property in Kashmir. So that that disparity has also been addressed. Okay, fine. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Dipankar Sengupta, please, we'll have you. Uh, you may unmute and uh, ask a question. Uh, Mr. Sengupta, kindly unmute. Yeah, ask yeah. a question. Yeah. Uh, this is with respect to Professor Du Onli's uh, presentation. Uh, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, congratulations, uh, Professor Lee. One point, I mean, there are so many things that are coming to mind, but one point uh, that should have, uh, you know, that basically differentiates uh, the Indian experience from the South Korean experience is the emphasis on scale economies. Uh, whenever Korean companies, Chebos, went on to do something, they looked at the global production and they, they, the scales were also uh, commensurate with uh, global economies of scale. That unfortunately was not the case with India for a long period of time. Uh, we started shipbuilding before you did, but uh, when you started it, Hyundai built such a big shipyard that they were able to sell their products at very competitive prices. India unfortunately has not yet caught up to the scale economies part. One observation, that's all. I'll get you. Well, that is true, uh, especially in terms of the shipbuilding industry. Uh, when we uh, tried to establish shipbuilding industry in 1970s, from the very beginning, we tried to build export-oriented shipbuilding company. So we invested a huge amount of money and we, we built shipbuilding a dockyard in, 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 a, in, a, in a very massive scale. But the other industry have different story, like uh, automobile industry. In the beginning, when we tried to promote automobile industry, uh, we actually did not start in such a, such a massive scale. In the beginning, we tried to produce automobile only for domestic market. And then only after we get some experience and some you know, uh, accumulated profit, then we expanded our production scale and we try to you know promote our export only after you know, probably uh, in the in the late 1980s so uh, yeah we we do have two different kinds of stories and i, I believe that india has can can take advantage of very large domestic market indian domestic market alone is very large unlike korea in the middle of the 1980s korea's domestic market in the middle of the 1980s was very small 
for probably uh, in terms of automobile, if only produce uh, half a million passenger cars, that would saturate Korean domestic market at the time. So I think uh, India can uh, find implication from Korea as well in this sense. You can first try to take advantage of your relatively large domestic market and then eventually go for the world market. Uh, thank you, Professor. Now, we have two more questions. One is from Professor Pandita and the other one is from uh, Ms. Nidhi Bahuguna. Uh, we will take both these questions together. Uh, Professor Pandita, uh, please ask your question, sir. I, have, I would like to have clarification on two points that have been raised here. Number one goes to the first speaker, Madam Kaur. Uh, would she be able to clarify the status of minorities in Jammu and Kashmir in the light of the fact that the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir does not recognize any community on religious or ethnic or whatsoever as a minority. But at the same time, the state uh, accepts the benefits which accrue to a minority, particular minority, uh, as given in the Indian constitution. That's one question. What would be the status of the minorities? Although, at, as long as the union territory laws exist, this does not come in. But after all, if the state, state status is revived, then the constitution will come into force. That's one question. My second clarification is from you, General Saab. Uh, you said that uh, Article 35A was done clandestinely and without the sanction of the parliament. Uh, I understand that Article 35 uh, draws its strength from Article 370. Article 370 empowers the, govern the government to introduce any law which would, uh, which would uh, consolidate the essence of Article 370. So I think that there was no necessity of asking the parliament for the approval of Article 35A. That's my thinking, but I would like to have clarification on that. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Nidhi Bahugana, you may ask your question. Nidhi? Yeah, mine was just a statement. Yeah. I just wanted to say uh, the difference between the, the laws in 35A and now is that all domicile holders whether they have served in Kashmir, whether they are Gurkhas, the one who all get domicile can buy property. And in many hill states, because of environmental reasons, we have restrictions from, from outsiders, I mean, the non domicile holders are buying property. So, I mean, in this context, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Right. Uh, Ms. Smriti Kark, you may answer the first one. Smriti? Yes, sir. So from what I understand is that uh, Professor Pandita wanted to know what is the status of who are going to be eligible to be, uh, you know, sort of uh, named as minorities in, in the UT of JNK. Um, I, I don't think there's a clarity on the issue just yet, even though the government has clarified that uh, just as other states have a national, uh, a state minority commission, so will the Union Territory of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. But the last that I that I know of it was uh, when uh, when the when, when we had a last government in place, the BJP PDP government in the state. Um, the issue was raised then, and there was some kind of because it's been a you know part of the BJP's political um, you know um, uh, manifestos that they want to designate Hindus uh, as a minority in the in in the state. Uh, but when the issue reached the Supreme Court, there was no clarity on the issue. Both governments uh, at the center and the state had. Um, you know, there, there was ambivalence on the issue. They could not really arrive at a consensus on whether Hindus could be designated as minorities. Uh, since then, the only, uh, you know, whatever little I know, the only thing we know is that the government has been suggesting that there will be some kind of a stock taking of who can be uh, denoted as uh, minorities in the state, uh, because 
uh, like I said, they have, uh, they want to implement, uh, you know, they want to have a national minority commission uh, the, or the state minority commission uh, in the state as, in the UT as well. But barring that, I'm sorry, even I don't know how far, uh, you know, what is the progress that has been made on this particular issue. All right, thank you, Smriti. Uh, Professor Pandita, um, your point is well taken. That is, a, that is one of the points of view, but I don't follow that point of view. And I'll give you my reasons why. Anything which comes, comes into the Constitution of India, even if it pertains to a, a particular section of the Constitution, which uh, has undergone a change, I'm afraid it has to go through the parliamentary route. There is no way in which anything can come into the statute book without being approved by both the houses of parliament. In this particular case, it has not happened. And this is the only instance in history from the date the constitution was promulgated in 1950 till now that it hasn't come into the statute books, uh, that it came into the statute books um, without going through parliament. Uh, the, the, the point which I'm making as to why I think it is a fraud was because after having put it in, uh, put in 35A, it didn't find its way into the constitution books. Now, why wasn't it mentioned except it was mentioned only once. Uh, the first time when it was introduced, they put it into the book. And after that, they covered it up to the extent that even uh, lawyers in the Supreme Court of India, many of them were not aware of the provisions of 35A. I'm absolutely certain it was a fraud committed on the constitution. It should have been that it should have been debated and it should have been passed by both the houses. That is my view. But of course, um, this point can be further debated. Uh, We'll have the last question now from Shakti Munshi. There's no way I can say no to you, ma'am. Over to you. Uh, please unmute. I have two observations to make. One is um, Pandita ji is uh, he's my guru, but I'll make an observation there. Uh, he says that uh, the 370 gives them the right. 370 does gives them the right to modify, modify and have exceptions. It does not give anybody the right to add into the Indian constitution. And 35A, without getting emotional, if you talk only legally and constitutionally, it does not give the JK government or the president, which is the executive power and not the legislative power, to include an article in my constitution. So that is to Dr. Padita ji. So it is a fraud. I agree with the, uh, uh, General Drew. It is a fraud on the Indian constitution. Then talking of uh, the minority issue that was raised, yes, there is something now that it has come under the Indian constitution, there's something like a reverse minority in the uh, defined in the UN. So I'm sure the government will look into reverse minorities when the majority becomes a minority in a state and uh, or a union territory. So here, though India is a majority Hindu state, but in the uh, UT of JNK, the um, Hindus become the minority, so it will have to be considered by the government of India as a minority of the state. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Shakti ji. Right, I think with this we will um, we will bring this particular session to a close. Uh, it simply remains for me to thank our two very brilliant speakers, um, Ms. Uh, Smriti Kark and Professor uh, Du Wan Lee. Uh, both the talks and the presentations are absolutely brilliant. Uh, I personally have had great uh, had an occasion to learn a great deal for them, and I was privileged to be the moderator for this uh, for this particular session. So thank you to both of our uh, very esteemed speakers, uh, and thank you everybody uh, for taking time out to watch. Uh, with this, we close this particular session. Namaskar, Jai Bharat, Jai Hind. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank you, uh, Major General uh, Dhruv Katoj, for moderating the session. And uh, many, many thanks once again to both the speakers, Ms. Uh, Smriti Kark and Professor Davon Lee. We now move over to the next working session, which is focusing on new growth and developmental models. For this, may I now call upon Sri Sakti Sinhaji, who is the Honorary Director at the Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Policy, Research, and International Studies at MS University, Baroda, and who is also a Distinguished Fellow at India Foundation. Over to you. You, sir. Thank you very much, Sonu. Good morning to people in India. I think good afternoon to people in South Korea. We move on from contentious issues like 35A and minority rights to something which normally should be very prosaic towards knee growth and development models. But knowing the history of Kashmir, especially the history of public finance in Kashmir, 
and uh, also not just public finance, is that since the early mid 50s, the policies of governments of India, irrespective of the party in power, and I'm repeating that, irrespective of the parties in power, has been in contentious areas, in areas of insurgency and violence and terrorism, to try and buy off the elite with massive amount of development assistance. Entire North East is flush with it. Kashmir is another example of it, where on a per capita income basis, the fund, fund flows from central government, federal union government to the state, compared to say Bihar, was it the ratio 10 is to one. So every one rupee per head which went to Bihar, 10 went to Kashmir. Has it resulted in better development outcomes? That is something which our first speaker today, my old friend, Professor Dipanka Sen Gupta, is Professor of Economics at the University of Jammu. He, of course, he writes that his areas of interest include international political economy, which you saw in his question to Dr. Professor Lee, competitiveness and entrepreneurship. He was previously a Ford Foundation Fellow at the International Trade and Foundation Division, Center for the Studies of in Diplomacy, International Law and Economics, SIS, JNU. He's an MA and PhD from JNU. And in fact, in one sense, he's going to carry on from where Dr. Lu only left. Because there were a lot of interesting things there, which I'm sure that Dipankar, who was again, as I said, had a very deep study of public finance in Kashmir and compared it across. And hopefully, with that background, he'll be able to talk on the problems and prospects for economic growth in Jammu and Kashmir. What is the time, Sonu, given to you, speaker? 15 minutes? Not more than that, I hope. Yes, sir. We can give them 15, uh, 15, 15 each, and then we can have the then, open Because home. we want to, yeah. The banker, your 15 minutes starts now. Okay. So let me first uh, share my screen. Uh, yeah. Share. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. So I've titled my presentation, you know, problems and prospects of growth in Jammu and Kashmir and a suggested way forward. Now, uh, uh, okay, so let, let us have a preliminary look at this particular state. I mean, this is uh, how, how the erstwhile state looked like, its population is given to you. And uh, what does it look like today? Uh, it's now split into two union territories. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir is the smaller thing in pink, and Ladakh is, of course, the larger thing in green. Of course, uh, much of Jammu and Kashmir is retained in India. Ladakh, of course, is split into three parts Aksai Chin area going to China, and the northern areas, Gilgit, Pakistan, going to Pakistan. Now, this is basically the districts of Jammu and Kashmir. Of course, when it comes to lay again, the northeastern corner is in Chinese hands. And this, these are the three divisions. This basically gives you a better picture as to what is in Indian hands, what is in uh, Chinese hands, and what is in Pakistani hands. So that's Kashmir, smaller than Jammu. And Ladakh, of course, is the largest part of that particular area. About 40% is retained in India, 60% by uh, China and Pakistan. And this is what the terrain looks like. If you look at Kashmir, the valley of Kashmir is largely plain surrounded by mountains. And if you look at Jammu, it starts with a small sliver of plain space, and then it continuously keeps on rising till it reaches Kashmir. So this is a hilly state. Now let us describe the story so far, the economy, the story so far. It's a hill economy until recently, and recently will be 30 years ago, it was an agrarian economy, not much industry. And uh, there was a tertiary in the sector still there. And in that tertiary sector, uh, tourism once played a very major role. It does not do so today. Now, what is the consequence of being a high, uh, high cost econ a hill economy? You're a high cost economy. It's an outcome of geography. It is compounded by poor infrastructure, but geographical conditions will remain, ensure that you remain a high cost economy because the cost of that infrastructure has to be reflected somewhere. And it's a common feature of all hill economies, um, national or international. Now, if you look at the structure of the GSDP of Jammu and Kashmir, the state's GDP, then today, and I'm looking at 2017-18 figures because it's a last normal year. 
uh, after that things start to become abnormal unrest and so on and so forth so i've take a taken a representative here uh, agriculture 16% industry 27 or 28% services 56% now there has been a structural change because in 1980 the corresponding shares of agriculture was 47.4 industry was roughly 13 and services was roughly 40% now if you compare it to a neighboring state which is also a hilly state comparative in size when it comes to population then if you look at himachal pradesh then agriculture is 16.7% industry is 41.6% and that is a figure india would be proud if it was a national figure and services a 39.5% and in services for himachal it's tourism that dominates now let us look at the public expenditure of jammu and kashmir and here i want to point out the centrality of government expenditure and the weakness of the private sector total government expenditure by the state government is 57% of its total gsdp only 43% is contributed by the private sector now this is uh, why again 2018 because it was the last uh, uh, year and it's it's been steadily rising by the way if you look at this year's figures it's 54% government expenditure is 54% now compare it to himachal pradesh neighboring state for himachal pradesh the share of government expenditure in total gsdp is 27.3% that is half the share of jammu and kashmir and the same is the figure for uttar pradesh so it's not that himachal pradesh is absolutely very very low if you take a mainstream state that is basically the representative figure and gdp government expenditure and gsdp ratios it used to fluctuate in the previous year 40% 45% now the new high is 50% 55% so there has been a structural shift it was high to begin with it has even become higher now if you look at where this expenditure money comes from then you can see the bulk of the expenditure does not is not generated by the state it comes from central government grants now these are transfers by the central government which are not part of the state's mandated share of taxes this 44% is a discretionary grant so 44% of this 57% comes from the central government and if you look at where the money goes that's the next slide i mean uh, salaries and pensions it's their power is their capital expenditure many states would be proud 26% of the total expenditure if it's capital expenditure if it goes to build roads buildings etc is something a state should be proud of and others basically is general government expenses that is not something that people should be proud of that's 35% of course this year capital expenditure has been boosted to 37% now this has been a consistent feature of jammu kashmir budgets for the last 15 to 20 years capital expenditure has been a very high part of the total expenditure and then we will see what the state has got for this high expend high expenditure and capital now for himachal pradesh if you look at the outright grant received by the central government that's roughly 13000 crores it is 40% roughly 35 or 40% of what jammu and kashmir receives so himachal does receive central government assistance it's a fraction of what the jammu kashmir receives and on paper the capital expenditure of jammu and kashmir uh, of himachal seems to be about 1/6 that that of uh, jammu and kashmir and we will see what the differences are now again i'm sorry this looks more but i'll tell you what the feature is for all the government expenditure and the central assistance given by the government of india to jammu and kashmir jammu and kashmir's per capita income is ranked 26 it is substantially lower than india's the all india average per capita income where himachal pradesh is substantially above it so himachal is much richer than jammu and kashmir in spite of much less central assistance and jammu kashmir in spite of receiving so much central assistance is substantially below the national average when it comes to per capita incomes and the growth rate of per capita incomes in the last 8 years as a as approximately 4% is again slightly below that of the national average now in social sectors jammu kashmir sometimes does better than the other states for example over overall literacy rate worse than the other states but catching up it does well when it comes to life expectancy poverty rates slightly better 
And when it comes to sex ratios, alarming picture when it comes to male-female sex ratios, it has become worse than the previous census. Now let's look at hard infrastructure because this is what we need when you basically need want economic growth. Now, if you look at the power generation capacity in Jammu and Kashmir and compare it to Himachal Pradesh, the total installed capacity of Himachal Pradesh is 10,000 megawatts, or Jammu and Kashmir is 3,500 megawatts. And much of the capacity in Himachal Pradesh is privately owned. Whereas in Jammu and Kashmir, the bulk of it is owned by the central government and some parts basically owned by the state government. Now, if you look at the length of the roadways, another uh, sector in which a lot of expenditure has gone, and you compare it to Himachal Pradesh, these are the figures. Now, state highways, abysmally low, but then there's, an, uh, there's a reason for this. Many of the roads that connect the various districts happen to be national highways. But if you look at PWD roads, roads in the rural areas, and compare road density, that is kilometrage of road per kilometer, uh, per square kilometer across the two states, then Himachal Pradesh is about five times more than Jammu and Kashmir. Now, you can say it's a much larger state. Even if you take away Ladakh and assume that Ladakh has no roads, you multiply this by two and a half times, it is still substantially lower than Himachal Pradesh. So, in so public investment in Jammu and Kashmir has not translated to actual public infrastructure on the ground, no matter what parameter you basically take. Now, let us talk about the way forward. How do I go? And there are three sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Okay. Now, we have to ask ourselves the question that when an economy is naturally high cost because of geographical conditions, how do they compete? And the answer is that they don't compete. What they do is to seek out niche areas where customers are willing to pay more. What does it mean? In the, mean, in the context of Jammu and Kashmir, it means that this union territory should now concentrate on those goods and services where a similar advantage exists. So don't uh, rush into those goods which are being made by everybody, where there are scale economies, cost economies are extremely important. Go into niche areas where customers are willing to pay more. And these are areas, as it will turn out, extremely labor intensive. And of course, you need, with the, in the context of Jammu and Kashmir, you need environmental safeguards so that this, is, this becomes sustainable. In many cases, you need a decentralized approach. It's not something that can be uh, guided only by a centralized state government or the central government. You need to involve other stakeholders like the Panchayati Raj institutions, blocks, districts, because many of these particular products, etc., are unique to those areas and without their help, it is possible to develop or implement a particular policy aimed at boosting those things. Now, if you look at agriculture, agriculture suffers from low productivity. And it is because of low technological inputs. It's also the consequence of very low investment in uh, irrigation. Indus, Valley, uh, Indus Water Treaty, by which the bulk of the river waters of Jammu Kashmir goes to Pakistan, has a role. But the fact is, even under this treaty, you are allowed to draw a lot of water, which the state government does not, because it has not built the necessary canal networks over the decades, so as to ensure that these areas, the areas which are water deficient, become more and more productive. Now, if you look at horticulture, two things are striking. One is low productivity. The productivity of apples, and I'm talking, when I say uh, area under food, it's largely apples. There are other crops also. And if you look at the productivity, the productivity is less than 10 tons per hectare, which is a third of that of China. It's a third of that of China, number one. Number two, it's one eighth of that of Italy. And the bulk of the fruit is exported to the rest of the country without adding any value. 84% of the total fruit is expected raw. Now, this sector is an 8,000 crore rupee sector or a billion dollar sector. If, on the other hand, it was to be trebled following China's results, it automatically becomes a $3 billion thing. And if you are European standards, then it becomes $8, $8 billion. So, immediately you can see the amount that, you know, you're talking about doubling farm incomes. This is an absolutely fit area where technology can be applied to actually double it. Now, the thing is the following. <clears throat> Why hasn't it happened? 
It has happened because the institutions in the state, the agricultural science and technology institutions, have not been able to play the same role as they have in, say, Punjab. So productivity is low across sectors. And even though apple is an imported crop, the entire apple rootstock has to be imported. Which is not to say that the scientists of these universities are absolutely useless. There are entrepreneurs who have basically followed the Nisha model, a net, uh, Nisha model. What they have done to increase productivity, to standardize their goods, they have hired these very same scientists from the two uh, agricultural science and technology in Srinagar and Jammu. And they have basically made all the necessary changes, given instructions to the farmers, so that the farmers are able to grow uh, products in a manner that we, they become internationally acceptable and they can, be, they can be exported. So the ability exists in these institutions, but institutional reform is required. Secondly, I'll just talk, briefly talk about the importance of decentralization. You see, <clears throat> You cannot have a one-size-fits-all strategy because the niches are different. What is required by Apple is not required by Saffron. What is required by Saffron is not required by Walnuts. And these are spread in the various districts of the state. These are high value, very high value, and they are very low volume. So the cost economies which uh, beleaguer production of other goods in this particular state is not a problem out here. But the productivity out here is extremely low. And this productivity has to be increased, which will lead to substantial increases in incomes locally, but it has to be done at the local level involving local stakeholders. And I'm not just talking about horticultural products. I'm also talking about local milk products, the various kinds of cheese. There are some districts in which the local variety of potted cheese is very, very good. Unfortunately, although North India is a fantastic market, huge market for these kinds of cheese. This has not been popularized in North India. And the public goods for these particular uh, products have to be arranged locally. You cannot arrange them centrally. Now, <clears throat> if you look at handicrafts, again, another big sector, which is facing a particular problem. It employs 400,000 artisans, but increasingly the younger generation is becoming extremely reluctant to take up this particular profession because there has been no, no effort to integrate with, this, with the tourism sector, give it the kind of respect that enables or encourages younger people basically to uh, <clears throat> adopt this particular profession. And there has been no effort to mainstream these goods uh, as premium items globally. Much can be done out here. It can be modernized and its aesthetic value still can be maintained. And you could have a far global, larger market than you have actually currently. Now, tourism. Why tourism? Tourism con uh, contributes 7 to 8% of GST in normal years, and this can be multiplied many fold. Why tourism? Because tourism's labor multiplier, employment multiplier is extremely, extremely high. Its ability to absorb all kinds of labor is extremely, very high. Now, if you look at tourism, Jammu Kashmir has a buzz where tourism is concerned. People have heard of Jammu and Kashmir. But if you look at the number of tourists it's received, it is slow, it's lower than its share of population in the entire country. Now, if Jammu and Kashmir were to follow the in the footsteps of Tamil Nadu, you know, Tamil Nadu is the state that receives the highest number of tourists. If it receives the same per capita tourists that Tamil Nadu receives, the tourist arrivals in this state will more than treble. Now, if you look at tourism in Jammu and Kashmir, the tourists that go to the valley of Jammu and Kashmir are premium tourists. They spend more per household or per room than in Jammu. Jammu happens to be uh, pilgrimage tourism, but there are several sites in Jammu that can also be developed as premier tourism. Now, <clears throat> what has to be done? The carrying capacity has to be increased. What do I mean by carrying capacity? I mean that you have to invest in sewage treatment, waste management plants. The fact is, as I said, there has been so much investment in capital, public expenditure on public investment in the valley. And yet, when you set up a hotel, the hotel has to set up its own sewage treatment plant because there is no overarching centralized sewage treatment facility. 
and this is Srinagar, the capital of Jammu and Kashmir. So, carrying capacity of the valley, indeed the carrying capacity of the state can easily be multiplied many fold. And if you get into this, then this particular sector can easily treble without any problem at all. Now, there are problems of environmental damage, but this also can be managed. Now, people often talk about Kashmir as a place for tourism. And I will go show you some slides. And these slides are not slides of Kashmir, they're slides of Jammu. So as to make you aware of what is available in Jammu as well. So this is Jammu. People unfortunately confuse it with Kashmir. They also confuse this with Kashmir. They also confuse this with Kashmir and so on and so forth. All of them happen to be places in Jammu. And, uh, in Jammu. So <clears throat> when I talk about circuits, Kashmir is not the only circuit that is possible. There are several circuits within Kashmir that is possible. And there are virgin circuits in Jammu that are imminently possible. Now, this requires, as I said, infrastructure, governance capacity to handle extra tourism in a fragile environment. And we have an example before us where the shrine of Mata Vaishno Devi, located in a very fragile eco spot, gets 8 million tourists in a normal year, and yet it survives because it is so well managed. So this is something that can easily be done, although Jammu and Kashmir is an ecological fragile zone, and room capacities can be ramped up if homestays is to be encouraged. This also requires a degree of decentralization where implementation is concerned. Now, now it's time to so, wind up. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> now, when it comes to industrialization, one of the problems that you talk about is basically absence of land. Actually, it's the absence of a road network. There is land available. The absence of a road network, absence of power, low ease of doing business, which is a problem. Now, they are being addressed on a war footing, but Jammu Kashmir would remain a high cost, high cost economy even then. So again, they should focus on high value, low value volume items, uh, catering to niche markets. And we have examples of that, where local firms are basically exporting local rice, basmati rice, which are known for their flavor and aroma. In fact, the Punjab, Punjabi basmati rice adds Jammu basmati rice and exports it to the rest of the world. They are doing it out here. Now, this is conventional thinking. Now, if you want to break new ground, the role of institutions is paramount. And we have to free our mind. And one of the areas where the state does very well when it comes to research is biosciences. This is a biodiversity hotspot rich in reserves. It is not energy on a, a infrastructure incentive, a, 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 a infrastructure intensive. It is mobile and has a definite life cycle. And that's important. Why is it important? Now, what are the disadvantage? disadvantages? Disadvantages, no entrepreneurial culture in science and technology, no links with the science and technology protocols, no linkages with finance. And often policymakers in the state think that when they receive grants for incubators and innovation helps, they are seen to be grants for buildings and government jobs. This is a problem. There are institutional flexibilities. There is a lack of soft infrastructure to cater from professionals from other regions that will come up. Because you know you cannot set up an incubation or a startup and ensure that only locals uh, participate in this particular startup. You have to be as open as possible. Now, you have to in remove in uh, inflexibilities. And much of the soft, uh, soft infrastructure that cater to niche tourists will also cater to these people who you, you know who we want to act as catalyst talent. That they come, act as a catalyst, and tell our research scientists, look, apart from a government job or research, you can also become an entrepreneur. Now, knowledge economy is generated in the laboratories of universities, of startups, of corporations. Now, the universities do pretty well where biosciences are concerned. What is the problem? The problem is the following, that university students per se are extremely risk averse when it comes to professional choice. But once you have a definite life cycle thing coming in with venture capitalists and angel capital coming in, then you can tell the student, look, you don't have to be a businessman. You demonstrate your particular idea. If it is commercial viable, you will be brought out. And if you have a yen for business, then you can get into business. And that is why this linkage with capital is extremely important. This capital is mobile. It helps in technology demonstration. It has global links. Now, 
what about it it enabled services i think asking it may, uh, majors to set up their campuses right here is unrealistic because the quality of it training is low now there is talk of rural bpos in this particular state and rural bpos will have an advantage they will find the kind of labor they are looking for in the state which are educated and people of the state so far are averse to relocating but the problem with bpos rural bpos or urban bpos they have grown organically from existing bases transplanting them to jammu and kashmir is possibly more of a risk than we think of but by no means infeasible and this is the state of skills what i want to show you with the state of skills is the following that you want to make headway into various sectors unfortunately the level of skills that are required is something that the state still does not possess does the potential to make up exist the hard infrastructure is being put into place the ease of doing business is basically taken care of when it comes to the skilling jammu kashmir has not yet taken up in a major way now the ut of jammu and kashmir i would argue has the resources to ensure development that is high income as well as sustainable now an appropriate policy for the region is one that you where we you target niche markets and not economies so far poor governance and institutional weaknesses inhibits the effectiveness of these resource bases and it is here the policy makers all this while have been focusing their attention whether they are able to lay the path of sustainable development and growth it remains to be seen thank you very much thank you very much dipankar as usual you were very very detailed and you laid out the full road map and i think two things came out very clearly and i'll be very quick one of course that economic growth is not a matter of economics alone it requires a political economy the early political economy was a rentier political economy it lives off rents that they got we did not translate into development outcomes of the state and the second the slide ratio on the skills i noticed that uh, healthcare and power was quite high up yeah. that you have to ultimately invest in improving the capabilities of the people capabilities are high then irrespective of the raw materials or other things available or not available as we have seen in the case of korea why has my video gone off uh, as in the case of korea or japan that is not or taiwan for that matter that it is ultimately the human being make a difference and our next speaker i would like to say is a political scientist professor sankul ko is professor of area studies and director of center for advanced research in integrated future society at the yonsei university he has phd in political science from the free university of berlin he served as the chair of the research committee of the ipsa international political science association director of the yonsei area eu center and president of korean association of slavic studies and basically looks at comparatively and regional politics and i think his topic today the korean development state and its socio economic reforms including the new village movement so professor ko may i request you now to take over the floor <웃음> 네 방금 소개받은 고상도입니다 어 제가 화면 공유하겠습니다 thank you uh, now i want to share my screen Can you see my screen well? So today I want to talk about the Korean developmental state and its socio-economic performance. So what is uh, the concept of a developmental state? So when it comes to uh, managing the economy, there's a classical debate. Is state more important? Is the market more important? More state-oriented, we call it socialism. More market-oriented, we call it capitalism. So when it comes to a developmental state, we merge the two. So we do a market economy, but we put that under the state control. That is 
uh, the concept of a development uh, developmental state so it is very hard to say is it good or bad is a developmental state good or bad it depends on each country and it, dep in, it depends on each strategy so in countries where capitalism started early they would more uh, they would tend to have an early capitalism but when a country started capitalism uh, not early, then the state should intervene more. So talking about the Korean economy, it started as a state-led capitalism economy. And the center, the core for that was the Economic Planning Board called EPB. So is a governmental body which looked upon everything about the Korean market. So the three important policy was the five-year plan. They established this five-year plan so that the Korean economy can follow uh, this plan. That was the first important thing. Second, is that they coordinated, the EPB coordinated the investment where appropriate, where uh, the company can uh, make the most use of it. The number three was the industrial rationalization. So back in the 1960s, we worked on textiles, wigs, electronics in the 70s. It was steel, chemical, shipbuilding. In the 80s, it was automobile. In the 90s, it was semiconductor. So these are uh, the steps that the Korean economy went. So 10 year by 10 year, the Korean economy, the Korean industry changed very fast. And it was all thanks to the EPB driven by the Korean government and its industrial rationalization. So then I said that the EPB uh, did coordinate the investment to many companies. So how did they do that? According to uh, what? Korean government set the export as the meter. The company with more export was the more efficient with less export was the less efficient. So that was a clear uh, barometer. So the Korean economy was both uh, state-led and more export-oriented. So some of the highlights here, the export-driven dri strategy. The first was in 1962, so when the Korean government started the export-driven strategy, they devaluated the Korean currency, making one US dollar from 131 to 255 won. So the denomination was done in an overnight, making the export price half of what it used to be. So the price of Korean export uh, products became uh, more uh, efficient. Second was the export first policy. So exporting companies could use lower interest rates than other companies. So as you know, Korea does not have much resources. So all the resources are were imported and these exporting companies gained tax reduction for these raw materials. So that was one of the export first policy. The third is the monthly export uh, conference and was hosted by the president himself. So to look at how the export is going and it, it was done monthly. And the next thing was making industrial parks nationwide 
first one was Seoul in Guri. Second was in Gumi city. Uh, the third uh, park was in Masan in Gyeongnam uh, area. And that was a result uh, of uh, the national ties with Japan. And after that, uh, there was, it was in Busan. Finally, the most important thing is the general trading companies. So in the past, Korean the Korean companies were very small. So it was very hard for those small companies to manufacture and export. So the Korean government made that the small companies only manufacture and came up with big companies that can do the exports themselves. These companies were called general trade companies. So you see the slogan, they exported everything from toothpicks to missiles. They handled every product for uh, exporting. So they, these big general trade companies should had to be licensed by the company and by the Korean government. So you see the graph here in 1975, the percentage of exports done by general trade companies were only 10%. And in the mid 1990s, these big general trade companies exported about half of every Korean exports. And the big companies we call j today all had one of these general trade companies and they could grow thanks to these general trade companies. So from 1961 to 1979, about 20 years, the Korean export showed an annual increase of 40%. So it was possible because of certain uh, backgrounds. So the first success factor was that the global economy was booming. So when the World War II was over, the global economic growth was up to 4.9%. Compared to pre-World War II, it was a big boom pre-World War II, uh, the growth was about like 1%. In, 19, in the 1930s, there was the Great Depression. And until uh, the World War II, company, uh, many uh, countries have been protectionists. So the global economic growth was very much uh, hindered and the exports were uh, going low. So before World War II, export did not did not mean uh, much thing. But after the global the World War II, so many comp many countries benefited for uh, export first policies, and many countries came up with import substitution strategies. For example, Latin America. So instead of exporting they uh, shifted to self-manufacturing. So these were, this was what Latin America's went to. So they could not fully utilize the global economy boom, whereas Korea could benefit from the global economy. And the next thing, Korea had many employed workers, but they were highly educated. So in Korea, compared to other countries, after industrialization, uh, normally after uh, industrialization, the economy goes high. But in Korea, the education level went up high even before uh, in the industrialization. There, there was the uh, Korean government uh, putting effort as well, but there were personal efforts as well. 
and the sacrifice of workers was also high because the payroll of Korea was about half of Philippines and the Korean workers worked 10 hours more than Philippine, Philippine workers. Now, the new community movements or the new village movement. So when it comes to the cities, the cities and the big companies benefited for, from these policies. So the rural areas did not benefit much from these policy. So the Korean government wanted to increase the income of these rural areas. So starting uh, 1970 to 1979, this new community movement uh, has started. The core spirit was that the farmers can stand by themselves, have that spirit. But the rural areas were very poor. They didn't have any uh, supplies. So the government supplied what was needed for the farmers so that they can do economy by themselves. First thing here was improving the rural living standard. So the government provided cement and other construction materials for more than 300,000 villages. Cement at that time were overproducted, so the companies had to get rid of the overproduction, but the government took the cement to support the rural areas. And, that, and the farmers could utilize these uh, government provided construction materials. So they took these materials to build bridges, roads needed for their towns. So from the beginning, they, uh, the farmers provided labors. But when it comes to, when it uh, comes to 1973, the income of these farmers boosted very much. And after that, the government started to mechanize the agriculture process. So again, that needed much resource. Then the farmers could provide half of these resources and the company backed up half of the remaining resources. So there were some lease to the farmers and technological support for, for the farmers. And the government came up with the agricultural cooperative in Korean it's called Nonghyup. And the government also came up with uh, agricultural uh, production centers to provide more than uh, agriculture itself. So this is a picture of the farmers building constructing what is needed for these towns. So Korea now is no longer a developing country. Korea is now a liberal market economy. We say that. So in 1995, Korea started a liberal market economy. And that was when Korea joined the WTO for free trade and Korea joined OECD in 1996, and it was forced to liberalize its market further. 1997, Korea went to a financial crisis, and the IMF made the Korean market economy more liberal. That was a prerequisite for a relief fund. So now Korea belongs to a global production network. Now Korea is no longer a developing country now. So what we tried to do, what Korea tried to do, Korea wanted to overcome the middle income trap and Korea actually did. The middle income trap it was first introduced in 1960. In Korea there were uh, in, globally, there were 101 middle-income countries, 
And as of 2008, only 11 became a high-income country. And the 90 remaining countries are still classified as middle-income or more than that, a third of this, a third of these 90 countries actually became a developing country. Korea was very successful to overcome this middle income trap. And the four main factors of the, the success. First is well educated population. Second investment in technology. Third, the word ethic, good word ethics. And number four was an active FTA policy. So Korea currently uh, have FTA with the major uh, exporting countries like the US, China, EU, and other major countries. For all these countries, the FTAs are in effect. So this concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening. I think, as you're saying, you establish it very clearly. But the fact that Korea could break out of the middle income trap and become a high nation country. And I think many of us don't know that 1960, India's per capita income was higher than Korea's. And today they're not even comparable. But this conscious decision to move and to lift, look at different sectors in different decades, to give interest loans at low interest, to actually suppress wages for quite some time, till it moved up. Now Korea, of course, is a very high income country the dire states to actually suppress wages, and then later on to build the rural linkages. All these were decisions, political decisions, and not economic decisions. Economics is used, but economics is used in the context of a political decision, a political vision for what you want your country to be or your society to be. I think that has come out very, very clearly in the, both the presentations, which are in one sense, of course, two very different situations, Kashmir comparing with Himachal Uttar Pradesh and the country and where Kashmir could go. And on the other hand, look at how Korea, fairly short period of time. Of course, it had its ups and downs. It became an OECD country, it was a high income country in 96. And then suddenly we had the crisis, which again, Korea came out of it very, very soon. Through massive restructuring of the economy, including privatization of banks, getting new owners, what could not be handled was shut down. So being conscious that everything doesn't work everywhere, a success today, once a failure tomorrow, don't try to revive it, let it go, do something else. I think that message is very, very clear. We're now open to questions. We don't have too much time, I think, but you're open to questions. I see two hands. I see two hands. One is Yoon Kyung Na, and the other is Vaishnavi Singh. So could I request the first Yoon Kyung Na to ask the question? Analyst, please go ahead. No question, fully understood. Thank you. No understood? No, no question, fully understood. Thank you. Are you listening? How do you go ahead? How do you translate? What is the system? Oh. Uh, no, I don't have any questions. It was okay. kind of mistakenly uh, okay. described. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Vash Davis. Yes, ask your question. Hello. Yes, please. Am I audible? Hello. Yeah, you audible. Please ask your question. Yes. Good morning, sir. I'm Vash from Bihar. My question is from Deepankar, sir. Means more than question. It's a number of thoughts which I got after his session. So the first thought was, why you compared Jammu and Kashmir with Jammu and Kashmir and not with other states of India, for example, Bihar. And second, the problems which, which Jammu Kashmir is facing, for example, handicrafts and horticulture, that problem is faced by almost all the states or I can say throughout the world, this problem is being faced. And when it comes to tourism or infrastructure, we all know that 
Jammu is Jammu and Kashmir and the nearby regions are facing so much of security issues. So, don't you think more than um, more than investment in uh, those sectors, the um, government should focus on security issues? Because I can't uh, think of uh, suggesting my entrepreneur friends to set up is there is startup from Jammu and Kashmir because that's a very fragile ecosystem. Uh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Yes. Achha, yes. Uh, first, why compare it with Himachal? You see, because both are hill states. One of the excuses and one of the reasons you you know if you talk about economics in Jammu and Kashmir, is policy makers says that you know it snows out here, etc., etc. It's a hilly state. Everything is more expensive. But it is also expensive for Himachal. It is also exp ex expensive for Uttarakhand. So when these hilly states, whose topography is the same as that of Jammu and Kashmir, are managing these particular problems, getting infrastructure done at a much lower cost, Jammu Kashmir therefore has no excuse to say we can't do it because our uh, terrain is difficult. Number one. Let me come to your third question, very important question. If it is politically unsettled, why should I tell investors to go and invest out there? Remember one thing. In the state of Jammu and Kashmir, there used to be three divisions, Ladakh, Kashmir, and Jammu. The uncertainty and disturbance that you saw was largely in the valley of Kashmir, by the way. Secondly, these would happen in one particular year and for some weeks. So if you look at tourist arrivals, you would have thought that till 2018-19, nothing happened in Jammu and Kashmir at all. Because the tourist graph kept on going up continuously. So this uncertainty thing, agitation thing has a tendency to be overstated. Till Burhan Wani case in 2016, if you look at it, tourist arrivals in Jammu and Kashmir was not affected by political situation in Jammu and Kashmir. Once the insurgency was uh, tackled, tourist arrivals saw a steady growth. In fact, just before COVID also, they were seeing a steady growth. The wave two stopped it. So I would say that Political uncertainty has a tendency to be overstated in Jammu and Kashmir. The thing is, even if it exists, what prevents you from investing in Jammu right now? The old uncertainties are gone. Jammu has no problem. So you want to add, you add value fruit to Jammu. If Kashmir cannot do it, you can do it in Jammu. But again, as I said, political uncertainty, etc. is overstated in my opinion. And that's not an economic question. Many of the problems that you see can be tackled well before in hand and it may not for after a brief duration affect economic activity. Having said that, it is extremely important to reassure investors. And to a great extent, the constitutional developments of 5th and 6th 2019 was a step in that direction. The ambiguity over Jammu and Kashmir is now over where the government of India is concerned. That is a one very big step towards el eliminating uncertainty, which affects economic decisions. And what is being done subsequently is basically to allay all economic, all uncertainty. It is tragic that, you know, you have this constitutional development, things start to move on the ground and COVID happens. Otherwise, you would have seen a sea change in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, the specific problems you talked about, horticulture, um, uh, handicrafts, well, actually, if it is there in other states, it's the same problem, then they have to do the same things as well. These are major drivers in Jammu and Kashmir, horticulture as well as handicrafts. If they are your major drivers, then you have to pay special attention to them, find out what ails them and cure them. If the same policy works for other states where horticulture is important, well, and go do it there also. But it is also a solution for Jammu and Kashmir. Let me end out. Unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, please don't unmute me. I'm supposed to be chairing the session. Uh, you know, where I feel uh, the bunker, I get your point. But insecurity is different for an investor and for a tourist. For investors with long-term interest, the fact that an extortion raj exists in an insecure situation, which is there in the Northeast and elsewhere, 
does consider investors' ability to invest. So we should not rule it out. But yes, other points I agree with you. And uh, of course, I have another view that economic growth is not a panacea for terrorism. The two are very different things. But I'll leave it at that. We have a question from Shakti Murshi, and I'm sure she'll ask you about why do you think the scientists are not bad? Shakti Murshi ji, please go ahead. Yes, um, Dipankar ji's uh, was, uh, session was very, very informative. Thank you so much for it. But uh, it could also be that in sp despite so many grants and schemes that were there, the money did not flow to the people of Kashmir because of corruption. And I can give you one example because you spoke of agriculture, the agro-industry corporation. When Shakti, they... ji, Shakti ji, let me come in out here. I can give you many instances. I, I know. You see, for, of corruption. My thing is that since you are going on a positive state, I refrained from the, uh, I know. giving you facts where corruption would fully come out. So, <laughs> I, I would like to bring the fact also on the table because, you know, I don't like to camouflage facts. The fact is that agro-industry, where there was an earthquake in 2005, they cut one day's salary from the 400 employees. And that salary didn't go into the treasury. So you understand what kind of systems were there and how the common man suffered. That's what I want to bring to your notice. Thank but you. But that's fair enough. I think that I think is well understood. That's why I'd call it uh, when you have a culture of impunity, when extortion and corruption is justified, then obviously you'll have such distorted outcomes. Do we have any more questions? We have a comment, I think, from Nidhi Bhavguna in the chat box. How do you explain the rise, increase of 45% GST in Jammu Kashmir and 95% in Ladakh? Uh, Nidhi, of course, in Ladakh, I can tell you, it's called in economics a low base effect. Low base effect doesn't always apply everywhere else. Uh, but in Kashmir, it's 45%. Dipankar, what do you have to say about it? Yes, Dipankar, question to you. Uh, see, again, the fact is this 45% GST in Jammu Kashmir has to be seen because what happened was COVID struck and GST collections fell everywhere. This 45% increase of GST is possibly a low base effect. You are calculating from last year where collections were low to begin anyway. This is, you know, this is a very small part. You know, I mean, uh, taxation could be much higher in Jammu and Kashmir if it was a well-functioning economy. But as the direct, as Director Sinat told us, that the government of India had a certain way of tackling these particular problems, financial laxity, etc., etc., to, to buy the peace. And tax management and tax collections suffered as a result of this particular thing. Things are now being put into place. Everything is going online. You will think, say things change very rapidly. You would have seen it on the ground had COVID not struck. But again, um, I think uh, wait for a few, few weeks more that. and you will see a lot of announcements coming. My question to Professor Ko, and I have a question for Professor Ko, is basically that uh, Korea has been through this massive change from manufacturing economy to high-end manufacturing economy. You know, so you're moving from the bulk to the high-end to what is essentially now a very high level of service economy. People don't know that the internet speeds in Korea beat anywhere in the world. So it has completely been able to transform itself. Looking forward, where do you think Korea will be able to retain its niche in the world of international trade, in the world of international finance? Just a forward-looking question. So that is a very difficult question, I guess. So we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and we say we're living the fourth industrial revolution era. So now, where we are headed, I guess where we are headed is very clear. Robots, AI, and information, so these are all kinds of fields that every country who cannot catch up the speed, they won't be able to catch up with other countries. They will be a middle income country if they cannot catch up. So the most important things for the Korean government to do 
is how much we can invest, how much we can invest in uh, the R&D for these fields, how much we can invest. So Korea, we don't have much resources. The human resource is what we have, what we have to utilize in our economy. So this is the model we're working on. For the fourth generation of the fourth industrial revolution, Korea is obviously better prepared for than most of us. I can see that. The yeah. Pankaj wants to add some. You see, one thing that is not known by a lot of people. You see, what the government is doing is one thing. If you look at venture capital activity in Korea, are you on Kashmir or Korea? We are in Korea. Korea, Korea. on Korea. Korea. I'm talking about Korea. Yeah. If you look at venture capital activity in Korea, particularly the amount of unicorns that are basically coming in. Given the size of Korea's population, this is actually very, very high. You know, in India, we talk about our unicorns. In Korea too, this is a very dynamic sector. So it's not so much what the government is doing, what Korean entrepreneurs are doing, that's the main thing, and they're doing pretty well. Of course, 4G, the uh, fourth industrial revolution, also would create the fact that not just blue-collar workers, but a lot of white-collar workers will become more relevant. So you do not need so many doctors and lawyers other than care personal caregivers it is going to be a very serious problem for most of our societies we are far behind really advanced societies are facing this problem korea of course is really at the cutting edge so at, they have the first mover advantage where shall we very quickly you want, you want to say something very quickly please say it but do not make a statement like as we all know as a, a scholar and academic should never say we all know we all know nothing Anything you say must have a background to it, a reference to it. Please go ahead very quickly before I wind up the session. Okay, sir. So my question is for Ko, sir. So in Korea, as presented, Korea is developing so rapidly and the industries are being authorized by government. But in India, we are more focusing on privatization. And government is releasing its industry so my concern is how you people hand means in india it is criticized that government if government handles any industry so how korea is handling in korea does not have a public sector nationally all all manufacturing and factories are private in korea so please modify no. your professor Ko. Ko, sir, and in last session also it was shared that government authorizes industries of korea I will answer that question. So now, Korea is trying what you said to relieve uh, everything on private companies. In 1990s, Korea was a developing country until the 1990s. Now, Korea uh, uses free uh, market. So it cannot pose anything, any sanctions to any companies, any industries. The companies would not want that, and it's not effective anymore. So right now, Korea wants to relieve anything posed on the companies, any regulations. And we think uh, relieving these regulations would drive us to fourth industrial revolution further. I think uh, we have overshot our time. We started late, of course. We started about eight minutes late. We have now done an hour and three, four minutes. So I would now bring the session to a close. We have another session to go before lunch. So let me thank. We are two very interesting, but very different. That is a very different looking at how public finance was not used effectively in Kashmir to get development outcomes. But no, there is a way out of it. It's not an easy way out of it, but investments in human capabilities, in improving policies to encourage startups, in bringing about value addition, for which you can look at skills. I mean, fruit and vegetables are one of the biggest generators of employment in a lot of countries. And we tend to forget that. This is a sector which encompasses both agriculture and manufacturing. 
and therefore it can really act, become a first multiplier, income multiplier. So is tourism. The banker talked about employment multiplier, which it is because it generates a lot of jobs in transport industry, in the food industry, etc. So there are a lot of larger things that we have to look at. Can't look at a small part of the picture and expect good result. You have seen from the Korean example. How Korea went from being a poor country, an agricultural country, to a manufacturer on a bigger scale, exports, monthly monitoring by the president, and all kinds of steps taken to a stage where Korea reached to be known as the high-end commercial goods, and then in the sector of computers, especially the digital world, Korea is really at the cutting edge. So whether it is 4G, 5G, whether it is uh, in terms of AI. Self-learning, etc. It's really shown us the path. So there is a lot to learn from it. We have a tendency to dismiss success by saying, "Oh, they're a different country. Oh, the society is different. The size is different." I think that is the wrong approach. There's so much we can learn from each other all the time. Let me thank both the speakers for the very lucid and very focused presentations, and let me hand you over to the host, the Swami Vivekananda Centers at the Indian Embassy at Seoul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for moderating the session. And now from uh, new growth and developmental models, we move over to the next session, which focuses on quest for gender equity and social justice. Um, 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 for this, may I now invite Professor Byongwon Wu to preside over. And we have two, two very eminent speakers in this session, Ms. Ms. Uh, Shakti Munshi, who is the Secretary of J Jammu Kashmir Studies Center, and also Professor Na from uh, Uni uh, Yonsei University. Over to you, Professor Wu. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I think it's now okay to say good afternoon to everybody who's joining either from India or from South Korea. And thank you for participating in this symposium. Um, uh, it has been really, uh, I, I, uh, I've seen uh, really interesting discussions that's been happening for the past uh, two, well, you know, two days. Um, my name is Byung Wonu. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Yonsei University. I'm serving as a deputy director at uh, the Institute of East and West Studies. I also serve as the director of the Leadership Center, which is a part of the uh, Institute of East and West Studies. Um, so I'm honored to moderate the session titled Cust for Gender uh, Equity and Social Justice. Uh, I'm extremely interested in uh, what we will hear for the next 40 minutes, um, in part, be uh, personally, in part because, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, two of things that I research on um, are uh, human rights and official development assistance or sort of the foreign aid. And of course, gender equality is at the center of uh, these two topics. And we all understand that, uh, you know, gender equality is a, really important uh, uh, the concept that, and you know, it's a, it's a goal number five of the sustainable development, UN sustain, sustainable development goals, and related to some of the discussions that we've had in the previous sessions, um, uh, you know, development. So I, uh, I'm really excited personally uh, uh, and honored uh, to moderate uh, the session uh, for the next hour or so. So let me first uh, uh, invite the first speaker, um, uh, Ms. Shakti Munshi. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Shakti Munshi is the director of SITEC Lab and as an entrepreneur and social activist, she is also uh, the secretary of uh, Jammu Kashmir Study Center. Um, Ms. Munshi, if you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. And uh, one second. Can I share, can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Wu. And as he said, good afternoon to all in India and in Korea. Yesterday's sessions were where Dr. Dr. Pandita's session was there and Ms. Pooja, who was a um, participant there, had a concern about the falsehood by media on JNK YouTube. We will cover that, but uh, because that is very important to do with this topic of uh, recent measures to eliminate gender equality. There is so much falsehood on JNK that anyone can get lost in the smoke of untruths and half truths. So for that, I will just make a quick presentation of uh, 
what uh, Jammu Kashmir state that acceded to India in 1947 looked like. Yeah. Out of this, the slide speaks for itself, so I will not go into the details, but um, I can tell you that uh, a lot of it has been occupied by other countries, Pakistan, China, and uh, India has still a struggle to get these regions back. Now, out of that state, which was about 2,22,200 odd square kilometers, this place, which, uh, which are marked with orange, is the one where the trouble really started. There was infiltration, there was proxy war, there was cross-border terrorism, there was radicalization over a period of time, which culminated in 1990 with the exodus of a genocide, of, according to us, of the Kashmiri Pandits. But what was the history? Let's get into the history. How, why, and how did all this happen? Kashmir region had, Kashmir region, I'm talking of the specific area which I marked in orange, had Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. Of course, Hinduism was there since uh, a, more than 5,000 years back. And Kashmiri Hindus, you know, they were, they were the aborigines of the place. And the proof of that is in their um, astronomical almanac, which is running in, currently into the 5,097th year. So, and then Buddhism came in second century BC, Ashoka, and it spread across. And uh, from uh, Kashmir, Mahayana Buddhism was also, came, also came there, and it went to China, Tibet. So, but there was still peace. Finally, Islam comes into Kashmir in the uh, post-1339. Uh, but there was still peace, you know. This is the where our scholars used to gather to make a, what you call a jantri, it's called Saptarishi Sambhar. Uh, then the, there was still peace in Kashmir. So I want to talk about, because we are today dealing with the topic of women in Kashmir, I said, let me pick up, did we have any kind of strong women in Kashmir? Yes, we did. Yashovati, Suganda, Queen Dida. Queen Dida was a disabled, physically disabled. And yet she ruled the place with an iron fist. Kotarani. Kota Rani was in the 14th century, and uh, she was, uh, they say, she was responsible or she took the credit of commissioning the Putkol, Putkol, which anybody in Kashmir would know, you know, which is on River Jhelum, and it saved the city with funds, are with floods. So you can say, yes, Kashmir had a very strong women representation. Then comes 47, when the whole state uh, exceeds to India, exceeds to the union of India. When you say it exceeds to the Union of India, it says the Union is stronger than the states. And once you exceed, there is no secession, legally and constitutionally. So in 1947, I'm talking of the Kashmiris, both Hindus and Muslim women, who along with their men were resisting the tribal invasion of Pakistan. And the slogan they had was, Hamlawar, Khabardar, Ham Kashmiri hai tayar. So Kashmir was a peace-loving place where everybody lived peacefully then too. And of course, then came uh, Raj Begum, who was, you know, who became the first female artist to perform on Didi Kashmir. And I felt very sad when the girl band of Kashmir was asked to withdraw. You know. And then came Hanifa Chapu, you know, the first woman of Kashmir to get a Munshi Fazil degree in Persian. So Kashmir had very strong women, or, or to, even in the 47, in 47 too. Then what really went wrong? You know, all throughout, due to neglect of the central government and the power-hungry state people, state politicians, we got a lot of cross-border terrorism, radicalization, Islamization started taking place in that in that region. And as uh, Sen, uh, Professor Sen Gupta said it, it, all this spread from that little 5,000, 15,000 square kilometers to the rest of the state, you know. And the local political parties then used democratic instruments for personal power and exploitation of people of the state and the rest of India, which caused a threat to the Indian security. Ancient Kashmir, which was pluralistic, and a dynamic society now became a separatist hub and jihad was the agenda. 
the fight that the Indian government had to do. And of course, 370 was given to them at that before that. And 370 was not given only to Kashmir. There were many such concessional things given to many states under chapter 21 of the Indian constitution. Like 371 is also there, you know. But in Kashmir, the fight was came to jihadism and secularism that the central government, after initial soft peddling, had to take a strong decision to protect not only the locals of that place, but also to protect the rest of India and India's integrity. So this is the state that Kashmir was pre-5th August, you can see, and you can see the Union territories. That's what it, it is today. This is your article. Most of the people say abrogation of Article 370. Let me make it clear, it's not abrogation, it is decommissioning of Article, because when we use the wrong word, it, it carries forward. And ultimately that becomes the truth. Like special, special, special status is, special word was, act, was added to 370 in 1973 as a 13th amendment for Nagaland. But people do not realize that it was not for Kashmir. So because he kept on saying special, 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 now everybody says Kashmir has a special status. So I want to make it clear, it was decommissioning of Article 370. This was what on your left, on my left is the one that was originally there and what it is today. So 370 has not been abrogated, it has been decommissioned. But what happened under 370? The politicians got power, they got greed, and they got corrupt. And the locals were suffering. They brought in Article 35A. There was a lot of discussion on Article 35A in the previous sessions too. Article, yes, the president had the powers for Kashmir. I agree, many, many people said it, the president has the power. But the president has an executive power, not a legislative power. And introducing Article 35A in the Indian constitution is a legislative power, which lies only with the parliament of India. So we have to get this clear in our minds. Yeah. So now we talk of women's rights. Now what did 35A do? Under 35A, they, they defined who could be the so who could be the domicile of that place. And uh, you know, not only the people who were living there, like the Gurkhas were living there for more than 200 years, they were the, denied of their rights. The Safai Karamcharis. That means they got them in, uh, I think, 1965 or 66, if the date goes here or there, please don't get me wrong. Uh, they were called uh, and they were given a domicile with a stamp that said only entitled for a sweeper's job. Which part of the world allows this, I want to ask. Then there were West Pakistanis who came from Sialkot. We, we shouldn't call them West Pakistanis. They were in refugees during partition who came from Sialkot. Our ex-Prime Minister Manmohan Singh also, they came from that region. Advani ji also came from there. Gujral ji also came from there. They became Prime Ministers and Deputy Prime Minister. But these poor people, who more 80% of whom were scheduled caste, they come in because they can't go further down into the place. They stay there. And what happens to them? Their rights are taken away. Their rights to leave a decent life is taken away under 35A because they do not accept them as citizens of that place, uh, at domiciles of that place. Now, I don't mind, uh, I wouldn't say I don't mind, but imagine how far they took it. They took it to their own women. Forget me, I'm a Kashmiri pundit, of course, but forget me. They took it to their own women and you have the chief ministers of that place, ex-chief ministers, who are advocating 35A when they have daughters whom they are depriving them of their fundamental rights. And you have a woman who you have an ex-woman chief minister, she is advocating 35A and doesn't realize she's a woman herself. Imagine the kind of political corruption that was happening there. You know? And they, what happened is a woman who married outside the state you know, they would stamp a woman's uh, document with valid till marriage. Not for the men of Jammu Kashmir. The, if a man married anywhere, anybody from anywhere, his wife would automatically become, and his children would automatically become the state subjects. 
but not for the women of Kashmir. So in 2002, there were cases filed. She got her rights legally for herself, but it restricted the rights for her to children to inherit those rights for uh, till 2000 uh, during in that judgment. Now, this was blatant gender discrimination. It was not only of, I will not say it's a religious uh, discrimination, it was a gender discrimination. It, they, did, uh, they discriminated between men and women, whether they were Hindu women or Muslim women, they were discriminated. You know, this gender discrimination even was against our constitution's basic format because it discriminated uh, uh, against Article 13, against Article 14, against Article 15, against Article 7, 16 of the Indian Constitution. Okay. And these are all on the grounds of equality and discrimination based on sex. So how can anybody justify 35A? So 35A had to be challenged and it was challenged on 5th August, 2009. Now there are questions people ask, oh, but why didn't you challenge 35A? Because now the strategies of how you make a correction is not my dictate. It is the government's responsibility, what they think best, they do. But this is, I've written it, you can read it. But in 2004, after it was challenged in 2002, he tried to bring back the Jammu Kashmir Permanent Disqualification Bill. They never gave up. The politicians of the local politicians never gave up. And the bill was passed by the Legislative Assembly unanimously. There was massive protest in Jammu region. And finally, the bill was not adopted. And if it had been adapt adopted, you know what would have happened further. Now we come to the women. So look at the women's literacy rate because education is very important. You know, so I've made a kind of a chart which I've taken from the census of 2011. The literacy rate in 1947 of India, which was almost around 12%, the Kashmiri Hindus literacy rate was more than 80%. So Kashmir had that kind of strength, you know, but this strength was not utilized, but was troubled, which led to the genocide of the Hindus. And now if you look at the 2011 census, it was the, if you take all the districts of Kashmir, their average literacy rate is 52%. District of Jammu is 56%. Ladakh, which was neglected. It was, it was really given a stepmotherly treatment. It was totally neglected, but their literacy rate, in spite of all the neglect, is 61%. So you have to understand what is really happening there? And of course, today, Kashmiri Hindu women, if we talk of women, are 90, more than 90, I, I won't say 100%, because that becomes a little this. So they are almost 100% literate. And what is happening to these people? There was a genocide conducted against them. They were thrown out. But how did they, how did they react to the genocide? Because they were literal, they knew how to cope with the problems. And today, if you see all Kashmiri children, none of them have terrorists, none of them have become stone pelters, none of them have become separatists. They are all doing well in the corporate world. This is just for the empowerment of the women. So education becomes very, very important. So the government should concentrate more on education of women in all the three, in the, both the UTs, and then look into sports because that will give them exposure to outdoor life and also technological awareness because technology is moving very fast. You can't still be in the stone age. So you have to give them an exposure to technological awareness. Of course, the health and nutrition and early marriage is not in a big way there now. And uh, one example I would give, I'm very fond of giving examples, maybe because that becomes authentic, authenticating your uh, you know, talk. In Norway, where I stayed, they made it compulsory for large companies to have women on the board. As a result, the women representation on boards has surged to 41% in 2013 when I visited them last from 7% in 2003. So this is the empowerment of women you need to do in 
in Kashmir, UT of Jammu Kashmir and UT of Ladakh. Now we go into, of course, there are a lot of good things that are happening in, uh, after 2019. Kashmiri Pandit was elected as a Sarpanch in a Muslim dominated area. So it's coming back to Kashmiriyat and what Insaniyat and Jamuriyat. Of course, it was all gone, but Jamuriyat was uh, destroyed, but uh, it's again coming back. And she's been elected Sarpanch in the Muslim dominated area, North Kashmir. Then there are Kashmiri Muslims. I'm giving the examples of different communities so that it's not. If one doesn't feel only one community is doing the work, there are all kinds of people working for it, women. There is Yana Mirchandana Chindani, who's a Muslim. She's actually voicing her opinion against Pakistan insurgency that's happening there and uh, stopping the uh, children or the youth from picking up arms and stones. There is Naomi Kaur, who's married an army officer from Bihar. Vaishnavi ji keeps asking a lot of questions. Vaishnavi ji, again, Bihar comes into the picture. Then there is Sunanda Vashisht, a Kashmiri Pandit, and we all have heard her in the UN. She talks about the Kashmiri Pandit. So there are a lot of women entrepreneurs that are happening around. And I'm, I've listed them. You can all go through it because I don't want to take a lot of your time. We are running behind schedule. You know, There are a lot of government schemes. But government has to understand the schemes are, there are very highly qualified women in Kashmir. They have to get into the system because still women are not into the system. Government can't all the time monitor the local people. So the local systems, they have to be women in that system. And I would advocate that the government looks into this, not just handholding for the basic, you know, small or medium scale industries. And opportunities, yes, post 2019, political social opportunities are available. They have launched Hostler, a strong foundation, for economic and social development, but now it's up to the women of, the, of Jammu Kashmir and the women of Ladakh that they empower themselves. Thank you. With this, thank I you. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Munshi. Uh, you've, you've done a marvelous job of uh, covering 5,000 plus years of uh, strong women's history in, in uh, in Kashmir. Uh, I've learned a great deal about great women leaders uh, of the past and the present. And of course, uh, I would love to learn more about sort of how you experienced that downturn in the women's rights uh, since 1947, uh, up until probably early 2000, then and, and, and rebounded from there. So uh, I'm sure the audience have uh, a lot of questions about your, um, your presentation, uh, your fascinating presentation. Uh, but now, uh, at, the, at the moment, we will move on to the Korean perspective, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start to gather questions for both of the presentations. So let me introduce the second speaker of the, of the uh, session, uh, uh, Professor uh, How is it deep? Na Yoon Gyeong. Yes. No. Uh, Professor Na Yoon Gyeong is a former president of the Korea Institute for Gender Equality Promotion and Education. And this is the public institution under the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family, uh, whose chief mission is to improve the gender sensitivity of Korean public officials and to create and implement gender sensitive policies. Uh, Professor uh, Na majored in uh, feminist pedagogy at the University of Wisconsin and is currently a professor in the Department of Culture uh, uh, Anthropology at Yonsei University. She has been uh, sort of working really hard to translate some of the academic jargons and terms into everyday languages of, uh, of people. And she served at Yonsei University as the director of the Gender Equality Center and the director of the Gender Research Center. Uh, so please welcome Professor Na. 네, 안녕하세요. 방금 소개받은 나 윤경이라고 합니다. Good afternoon. My name is Na Yoon I would like to share my presentation. Can you see it clearly? Yes. First of all, my congratulations go to 
the 75th anniversary of India's Independence Day and today's conference to commemorate the remarkable year. As a Korean who fully understands the joy of national independence, once again, I should express my congratulations on India's independence. I'm supposed to introduce agenda issues of Korea today, and I was wondering what I should focus on today. I believe that this conference has a purpose of a mutual understanding between Korea and India. And I thought maybe I should introduce the history of uh, struggling of the women for better democracy. So today I picked my topic as under the slogan of feminism perfects democracy. As you're well aware, Korea realized its independence from the Japanese colonization. Colonization, But after that, we were under military dictatorship for over 30 years, followed by Korean War. And uh, modern history of Korea consists of uh, Japanese imperialism, Korean War, and a military dictatorship. And that also is a history of uh, fighting, fighting for democracy. And I believe India also had the same problem. And the women were always there in the history, but uh, their names were not heard. And for the last 35 years, sorry, 35 years after we realized the institutional democratization, the Korean women's names were also missing from the history. In 1995, there was the fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. And even there, most of the people didn't realize the women as the genuine and important member of the social. So to correct that in the perspective of politics, economy, and social, they adopted a gender mainstream strategy. In line with that, Korea is also working on its feminist issues. However, still gender mainstreaming is not realized in Korea. Both Korea and India has a long way to go. Therefore, Korean women desperately realized there should be a lot of effort and the time to introduce the concept of a women's right and the women's roles in the society. In other words, the power and the rights should be shared among all the social members. And I want to say something to Indian women. Citizens' power and rights and authorization should be equally distributed based on gender equality in the course of democratization in a society. It is extremely difficult to insert what women is doing and the achievement that women did for the social uh, for the society. On top of that, Korea's feminists are struggling because they also need to adopt the concept and the context of the national development and industry industrialization. Korean feminists are well aware that it would be a long journey if we realize the industrialization and democratization before we try to discuss women's rights. Between 1910 and nine, about 1945, for about 36 years, Korea was under the uh, colonization of Japan. Sorry. Sorry, I was on the wrong slide. Sorry. So my first slide is called Genealogy of a Women's Movement, Oppressed and Never Stopped, but Not Completed Yet. Like Indian women, Korean women 
are on the way towards a democratized society and liber genuine liberalization of women. However, with a countless history of uh, conflicts and the strikes, the following events are of few and very few examples. And I believe that I can explain more due to our time constraint. So I thought about where to start to introduce the women's activists and uh, our Indian uh, speaker went back all the way to 5,000 years ago, but I will start with about 100 years ago. In 1898, there was a declaration on human rights. There were about 300 married women in the noble and higher social class who still only remained their family names claimed their rights for education, rights for participation in politics. They suggested the king then, King Gojong, to establish the women's school, but the king denied to do so. So then they collected and raised the fund to establish the uh, elementary school and primary school level of school. These noble women didn't get educated in the modern context. So I will say their, the existence of the Declaration of the Human Right is the example of a transformation of the feminism idea from the West to the East. Between 1910 and 1945, for about 36 years, Korea was under colonization of Japan. And Japan tried to colonize Korea with all kinds of schemes and uh, cheating methods. And to stop that, uh, Koreans initiated a national debt repayment movement between 1907 and 1908 because Japan tried to lend money to Korean women, uh, Koreans, not, the, not just the women, Koreans, and they were not able to repay their debts. And Korean women then tried to sell all the jewels and all the properties to participate in the national debt repayment movement. And in 1931, there was a labor movement of Kang Juryong, and that shows and demonstrates this interpretation of uh, Eastern women by Westerners, such the result of Orientalism. In 1931, Koreans were under extreme colonization and they had to change their name in a Japanese style and they had to speak Japanese. Kang Juryong was a worker at a factory in 1931 and she witnessed Korean labors were under extreme exploitation of a labor. And then she went up to 12 meters and did the fasting as a protest for 76 hours. And after that, factory workers, farmers, <coughs> students, and the new uh, women with a new education participated actively in all kinds of independence movement. However, the history only mentioned about a male independent movement. So in 19, 2019, to commemorate the centennial year of the independence movement, Korean government developed names of 347 women independent activists. And among them, 472 people are listed on our history and we will continue uh, such activities. And there have there had been more active women's activism and uh, monogamy, and to systemize it is one of the effort. And along with that, uh, the women tried to abolish 
the discrimination on wage and uh, working hours, and they tried to achieve the maternal uh, leaves, and they never stopped such effort to stop uh, some prostitution and human trafficking. And after the independence, Korea went through the Korean War at, starting in 1950. And after that, until 1979, for about 20 years, the whole nation was under military dictatorship by the President Park Jung-hee. Park Jung-hee administration realized the economy economic growth with the ideology based on the extreme uh, development and the great growth of economy. Well, as Professor Ko mentioned, there were a lot of uh, effort and sacrifice by workers, and that goes the same to both men and women. Women worked longer than men with half of their salary, but they still contributed to the development of the nation's economy. Right now, it's about 70% of the men's salary among uh, women. So up to 1983, the women's wage was uh, half of that of men. And most female workers were in their teens and 20s. And they usually had to support the tuition for their brothers or the families. And you can find the evidence from these fem female workers diary. Unlike other developing countries, Korea was able to provide high educated talents amid rapid growth of development. It's because these women fully supported their brother's higher education. And there were some protests from a company called YH and they were weak making factories and that factory made a huge wealth but they didn't provide enough compensation for their female workers. So the citizens were highly against this idea and who were also highly against the Park jung administration and this endless and effortless labor activism fully and highly influenced on the movement in the Philippines and Thailand. After 1979, we believe, we almost believe that uh, President Park's death ended military dictatorship for the 20 years. However, after that, another dictatorship hindered democratization of a Korean society. And along with that, for a very long time, on the way of democratization, women did a lot. And there have been major women groups created, such as Korea Women's Hotline, Korean Women Workers Association, Women Link, and Korea Women's Associations United. These organizations strive to secure rights of maternal protection between 1980s and 1990s. In 1990s, women fought for the pr protection of women from domestic violence and sexual harassment. As a result, in 1993, uh, Korea was able to establish the special act of uh, sexual harassment and the protection from about domestic violence in 1997. In 1960s and 1970s, there was some prostitution publicly for American soldiers and Japanese tourism, tourists. And in 1980s, there was more prostitution among Korean people and in 19, in, According to Korean Institute of Criminology in 2016, the size of the 
prostitution exceeded 30 trillion won. And in 1998, there was a presidential commission on women's affairs by the influence of Madame Lee Hee Ho, the former first lady of Korean president Kim Dae-jung. Korean women also initiated various activities and there was one example called Wednesday demonstration to claim legal and a genuine apology from Japanese government for the comfort women. I'm not sure you knew about this, but it's count, it's countless that uh, those comfort women had to sacrifice themselves uh, during the World War II for Japanese troops. And since the first Wednesday demonstration in 1992, we still have this uh, Wednesday demonstration and we just had uh, 1505 and there are only 14 comfort women survived and this Wednesday demonstration will continue. I mentioned about Presidential Commission on Women's Affairs and three years after it became as a ministerial level of gov organization called Ministry of Gender Equality. And in 2004, the government established a special act on prostitution. And in 2005, the government abolished the paternal family head system that had been on for six decades from 1945. In 2013, Korea mandates the training to prevent any sexual violence among all the social and civil workers. Still, we are still struggling with this sexual harassment. There was one female prosecutor appeared herself on TV to talk about the sexual harassment that she experienced from her male colleagues. And there has been so-called Me Too movement from various areas like literature, movies and celebrities and medical industries and athletes groups. And these victims suffer from not much of a punishment of offenders. In 2019, there was the decision uh, mentioning about the uncomfortable to constitution of the abortion. Abortion is not yet fully, uh, not yet become a fully criminalized. However, my body, my choice is the slogan that the, some Koreans try to protect uh, their own bodies, and we will soon realize that. Since 1898, with the declaration of a women's right, we have gone a long way. Over 70% of high school graduates of go to universities after high school and there are more girls than boys who go to universities but still we need to move forward to realize the genuine gender equality what we certainly achieved was just education still in politics administration and economy only less than 20 people of female members are able to do decision making. I also mentioned about wage inequality. Uh, still, women's wage is about 70% of that of their male counterparts. 
Korea is equipped with a decent legal system. However, at home, workplaces, public places, schools, and online, we are experiencing severe sexual harassment. Still, family care is the responsibility of women, and that restricts the participation of women's activities in politics and economy. And there is a great amount of backlash among men as a result of the female activism. So we fully believe we can realize the genuine democratization uh, with the genuine realization of the female uh, right protection. Uh, for example, a lot of women in, in their 20s and 30s in Korea do not want to get married. And it's now about 33 on average when a lady wants to get married. According to the recent statistics, we had a very severe fraternal rate, fertility rate, and we are now experiencing the decrease in the population. And we, we can solve these problems by elevating the women's rate. Once again, like 100 years ago, we believe women's right protection will genuinely contribute to the genuine democratization. And I hope to stand hand by hand, uh, hand in hand with the Indian women. A lot of women activists in India have exchanges with Korean scholars and I appreciate for sharing such insights. And through this conference, I hope to see more exchange and uh, collaboration in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Na. Um, uh, you just covered, you just covered uh, 120 years of history of uh, uh, women's movement in South Korea. And that really puts a really nice comparative perspective of histories of struggles for uh, gender equality in India and South Korea. And I think uh, you know it's, we can summarize the first and the second presentation with one of the subtitles that you gave as oppressed, never stopped, but not completed yet. So uh, can you please uh, stop sharing your um, screen? Thank you. So uh, now we've heard uh, two excellent presentations that again presents a nice comparative perspective on uh, uh, gender equality in India and South Korea. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use your raise hand button uh, on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Or you can use a Q&A button. So I have one hand from, uh, from the attendees. Uh, if I mispronounce uh, your name, please forgive me. Uh, Bashnabi Singhi. Please go ahead. Hello, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, hi, I'm Vaishnavi. So first of all, I would like to appreciate Naz, ma'am, because Korean women, we have always appreciated for their beauty and solace. Hello, sir. But the struggles she shared is really very, very inspiring. And we got a very, I got a very different perspective because of that. And my question is from Shakti, ma'am. Ma'am shared that Article 35A 
has affected women of Kashmir a lot. But in means when Kashmir is concerned, I along with women, 35A affected men also because it burdened them that they have to take care of those property and restricted them to stay in that place and not move out of that place. And even if even if we see the temporary migration, so permanent migration is very rare for Kashmiri men. Ms. Munshi? Yes. It's a very interesting observation. She looks at it, you know. Uh, she says, yes, it restricted men and uh, gave women the freedom to go to, you know, other places. I agree with you. It did restrict the men if it did, but the men could go elsewhere and have their uh, say in the state, whereas the women could go elsewhere, but they could not have a say in their state. Now, that is what is called restriction. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any other questions from the audience, the panelists? Um, Kayan Pandita. Pandita. Okay. Okay. Uh, mute, mute pe. Yes, uh, I would like to thank uh, Shakti Munshi for an excellent presentation. And very briefly, she presented the role of woman. Uh, one thing which uh, we would have appreciated her to add to her pres presentation was the threat element, which the woman in Kashmir I know you are really right. Most of the movement want to come out in open and tell the truth and be want to express freely what they think in their mind. But there is the element of uh, fear. Uh, that is uh, a debilitating element. Uh, and when will that fear go? We do not know. What do you think about that? the element of fear. Um, can I answer? Yes, please. Okay, there is an element of fear with the common people, but as far as I'm concerned, personally, I don't have an element of fear, but when you want to take everybody along with you, you somehow tend to go a little soft sometimes, you know, and <laughs> the absolute naked truth because you want to take the whole society with you and the, all the people of the region. So maybe that was the but when it comes to activism, yes, I'm fearless. But when it comes to consideration, I want to take everybody with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any other questions? So let me ask a, a question to uh, Ms. Munshi then. Um, while I was listening to your presentation, I was thinking about, so so as, as I understand, India is a, a democratic country where there's a free and fair election, right? And I was wondering why politicians, so you, you, you sort of talked about politicians have different ideas, uh, they deviated from the will of the people and how that was possible in, in Kashmir. It was possible because of Article 370. Mm. Anytime the center told them to correct themselves, as I gave the example in the past that there was a mm -hmm. corruption. Anytime mm -hmm. you told them that to correct themselves or not to do what was wrong, they mm -hmm. would um, you know, use the 370 against you. you know? mm -hmm. And uh, the center wasn't, I would say the center still has to be strong enough to put people or put the riot politicians uh, into a democratic framework and into the right place. But the center over years wasn't strong enough. Aara, sir, mera kuch aara, aapke naam se aara, lekin. 
to challenge the to challenge the um, the center wasn't strong enough to challenge the local it was only this government that was strong enough you know and you saw what kind of uh, media co coverage against it that went but they had to do it because ultimately the security and the integrity of the country was at stake mm. otherwise maybe maybe not so I see the similarity, right? So, you know, there was a North Korean factory in, in, in the past, you know, that might have been used as, a, as an excuse to oppress people. Now, you're, you're suggesting that, you know, the security concern that Kashmir had, had an impact on, on, on uh, you know, women's representation in, um, in Kashmir reason. Okay, I think we can afford to have one more question. वो ऑप्शन ही नहीं आया एचडीएमए वाला ऑप्शन ही नहीं आया था ओके सो इफ वी डू नॉट हैव एनी अदर क्वेश्चंस आई थिंक अम अम आई थिंक वी विल अम विल रैप अम रैप अप द सेशन अम so thank you very much, Professor Na and Ms. Munshi for giving excellent presentations. Again, I think it's not an easy task to cover 5,000 histories, 5,000 years of uh, women's movement in India or 120 years of uh, women's movement in, in South Korea, but, uh, yeah, but you've done a marvelous job again. Um, and um, I've learned a great deal from both of the presentations, okay. Um, with that, we'll conclude um, today's session. Now we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go back to the director of the um, Cultural Center. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Wu for um, moderating this session. With this, we come to, uh, to our final valedictory session. Um, I, in this uh, session, we have um, uh, uh, Sri Manod Sinhaji, um, the Honorable uh, Lieutenant Governor of Jammu and Kashmir, joining us live here today. Along with him, we also have Sri Ram Madhavji, who is the member of Board of Governors from India Foundation, also uh, speaking in this session. We also have Sri Dinesh K. Patnayak, Director General of Indian Council of Cultural uh, Relations, uh, who will also address in this session. And uh, to formally welcome all the dignitaries in this session, may I now request Her Excellency uh, Sri Priya Ranganathan, Ambassador of India, to Republic of Korea to give her remarks. Good evening. Good evening, friends. Good evening, Sonu. Uh, I will be very, very brief. I just wanted to uh, one just say how how enthralled I have been by all the discussions that have taken place both over today and yesterday. Uh, we've had some fascinating discussions on uh, on the on the historical context and the and the security situation yesterday, of course. And today, uh, what I heard from uh, from the speakers on both sides, very very eminent speakers on the on the developmental journey of uh, ROK and India especially in, of course, in uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. Uh, and the recent session on, uh, on uh, women's rights and the uh, uh, quest towards gender equity and social justice in both countries. I mean, it was absolutely uh, phenomenal and something which I have uh, learned so much from, especially as far as uh, uh, where our uh, friends, uh, where our sisters in Korea are at at the moment. Um, uh, hearty congratulations to all the speakers. I was also fascinated by Professor Duwan Lee, a very dear friend, about, on his comparative analysis of uh, uh, of the Korean Peninsula issues, uh, the, their growth trajectory and what we are seeing, what we have seen over the past few decades and what we will hope to see over the over the coming uh, years. Um, I'm, uh, we are, uh, as an embassy and a cultural center, we are really very honored to have uh, the opportunity to hear the uh, the insights and the and the thoughts of the honorable LG of the of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, and we are most grateful to him for accepting our invitation and joining us today. Uh, my dear friend uh, Dinesh, the Dinesh Patnaik, the uh, the director general of the ICCR, also I know 
He has been extremely busy, but has uh, made it possible to join us on this very, very uh, topical uh, theme that we are uh, addressing today. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the senior dignitaries of the India Foundation, uh, Mr. Ram Madhav, uh, Captain Alok Bansal, and the president of the Jammu Kashmir Study Center. We welcome you all and we are so grateful to all of you for sparing the time and uh, joining us for this uh, for this academic exercise that we have undertaken over the past two, two days. And we hope that we will have some, uh, uh, some ideas and some uh, fresh thoughts with which we will be able to build further on the connections between India and ROK, focusing on Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh in the, in the months to come. But that is something that the embassy will, uh, will start upon in the, in the coming weeks. But thank you all so much and back to you again soon. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. May I now request Captain Alok Bansal, uh, Director of the India Foundation, to preside over the session. Uh, thank you, Sonu. Uh, like all good things, uh, this, this program comes to an end with this particular session. This is the valedictory session. And we have had a very interesting, fascinating discussion in last two days. And it's uh, my pleasure uh, to invite uh, uh, Shri Manoj Sena, Honorable Go Lieutenant Governor of Jammu and Kashmir, to address you all. Uh, but before I invite him, a, a, a few words about uh, him to our Korean audience. Sri Manoj Sena is the second Lieutenant Governor of the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir ever since the Union Territory came into being. He's a seasoned politician who became a member of parliament as early as in 1996. And thereafter, he has been a member of parliament for two more terms. He's a He's a trained civil engineer with a degree of B.Tech and M.Tech from Indian Institute of Technology at BHU Varanasi. And uh, he has earlier, from 2016, uh, uh, served as Minister of State uh, of Railways, as well as a Minister of State of Independent Charge in the Ministry of Communications. So without wasting much time, uh, I'll now request uh, His Excellency Sri Manoj Sinha to kindly address the gathering. Sri Jawaharlal Kaulji, President, Jammu and Kashmir Study Center, Dr. Sonu Trivedi, Director Swami Vivekan Cultural Central Seoul, Captain Alok Bansalji, Director, India Foundation, our esteemed friends from Institute of East and West Studies, Yansai, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be here with you in the valedictory session of today, long enlightening discussion on various developmental dynamics related to Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh and future trajectories. I would like to express my sincere thanks to our friends from Republic of Korea, officials of Indian Council for Cultural Relations, India Foundation, as well as to Her Excellency Ambassador Sri Priya Ranganathan, who has made this conference possible. I am sure the International Symposium have had meaningful plenary and working sessions in the last two days, and Threadbare discussions on various issues would definitely help in crafting a new strategic roadmap in today's safe shifting reality triggered by COVID-19 pandemic. Recently, the 75th Independence Day was celebrated with great fervor across the country and Jammu Kashmir Union territory. Such moments are rare in the history of our nation. It provides an opportunity to look back and reflect on achievements and also formulate a strategic framework for future. Nearly 75 years ago, the then Home Minister Sardar Balabhai Patel had said, what happens in Kashmir will affect the rest of India. At the time, the Indian economy was still in its infancy. Many of our greatest achievements were still in dream. Journey means moving from one destination to another to evolve. Our journey is testament to the idea that following Sutra of Karma Yoga, 
selfless work, no matter how challenging the situation is, we can transform the society and the lives of those around us. In view of the many problems in the world, politics, war, conflict, crumbling empires, and pandemic, the last 75 years development, developmental odyssey for the country has been glorious. Our achievement in the economic growth, social justice, social equality, education, scientific advancement, national integration, and cultural preservation has been phenomenal. We have evolved as the world's fastest growing economy and a potential global superpower. But there is no doubt developmental speed and the spread in the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir was hindered through artificial barriers. It appeared to me when I took over the charge in August last year that a big pause had hit the Jammu and Kashmir in its evolution. Friends, in the last two years, and in one year we have rebooted the system and removed the fences that deprive people of rights and growth. I am sure my dear friend, His Excellency Lieutenant Governor of Ladakh, might have shared some valuable thoughts on the Ladakh during the inaugural session, so I shall keep myself confined to Jammu and Kashmir. Let me say this. After decades marked by discriminatory laws, the people for the first time feel empowered. The spectacle of festivities around the 15th August in far-flung areas and in more than 22,000 schools bears the testimony of a new dawn in Jammu Kashmir. The people craving to, the, to be part of complete national integration were overwhelmed with hope for a sustainable and peaceful future. In, after 2003, it was the first time in Jammu and Kashmir that internet and phone connectivity were not snapped. It was the first time, time since 1947 that every school, every single representative of grassroots democracy came together in solidarity to address and guide the young generation. In those celebratory moments, I could feel the heart of Indian ethos and democracy beating. It was for the first time we enshrined the memories of people from Jammu and Kashmir who fought British colonial rule and withstood periodic onslaughts unleashed by our immediate neighbor, also the biggest exporter of terror across the globe. We are honoring people from different sectors who have performed some great work in the last 75 years and integrated their contribution thinking and ideas with the national efforts. Some historical injustices also require remedy. The healing touch, approximately 60,000 families of Kashmiri Hindus along with Sikhs and Muslims were forced to flee their homes in 90s. I believe that every individual must be treated equitably and fairly by society. The human morality demands us such injustices are rectified, and just two days before Independence Day, we came out with Government Order Number 53 of the Revenue Department providing opportunity to the migrants to file grievances related to their property. All district magistrates will be required to dispose of the property-related grievances of the migrants in a time-bound manner under JNK Migrant Immovable Property Protection and Restraint on Distress Sale Act 1997. Within a week, we have achieved an online service for the migrant, migrants to lodge grievances. And I can tell you, we in the administration are committed to secure justice for these families. The society of Jammu and Kashmir is ageless and visible in the layers of history, which has been a witness to coexistence of almost all major religions known to humankind. And on 75th Independence Day, crowd thronged to the public functions to revive the values that define India, the idea of India. Friends, Jammu Kashmir is an example of immortal organic composite Indian culture. The sense of cohesion that we see today 
in the union territory is significantly contributing to equitable opportunity and strengthening integrated accountable and transparent governance. Over the past two years, we have also seen how much the world has changed due to pandemic, followed by economic and technological challenges that are confronting us at an ever greater pace. I remember American comic actor and writer said Caesar's famous line, the guy who invented the first wheel was an idiot. The guy who invented the other three, well, he was a genius. The ultimate result of every step that we take has to be the key for sustainable growth, work for every hand that would contribute to a robust economy. I have seen one of the working sessions today of this international symposium discussed new growth and developmental models. In JNK, our development and growth model revolves around four P's. Peace, progress, prosperity, and people first. It is my job every day to make citizens living standard a little bit better. Ancient economics, Chanakya gave us a hint of good leadership policy in fourth century BC. He wrote, and I quote, in all cases, he should favor the subjects like a father. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my strong belief that people are the center of governance and whatever policy we make must identify and fulfill their needs. Policy is not just a piece of paper, but a potent instrument with socioeconomic consequences for families and communities. Moreover, we need to perform our role of bridge builders and door openers for a large section of community which have endured hardship. Under the visionary leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji, we also did not hesitate for out-of-box solutions for the larger welfare of the people. Let me give you an example of critical sector of health. When I arrived in Srinagar last year, the total oxygen capacity of our hospitals were approximately 15,000 LPM. A month later, we decided to go full throttle as the fear of second wave was looming large. And within six months, this capacity was increased to 66,000 LPM and will reach to 90,000 LPM by September end this year. People often ask me a question. Did we face hurdles during the pandemic? Yes, of course, we did. But unlike various other parts of the country, we did not face shortage of oxygen beds and our resolve to strengthen our health infrastructure remain undetected. We also took a decision to decentralize the community health care by setting up a five bedded COVID care center in every panchayat of the union territory, as many households did not have the option for isolation of COVID positive patients in their own residence. While assessing the Jammu Kashmir response to pandemic last year in October, I had realized the participation of community was minimal. Since decentralized clinical management is known to be effective and efficient for delivery and ground, we decided that community participation was the best way to handle pandemic in the rural area. Today, people across the country are talking about our outstanding performance in vaccination. Newspapers are splashed with the pictures of healthcare workers walking 18 to 20 kilometers in the snowy and treacherous terrain to vaccinate people living in far-flung areas. Let me tell you, we had tailored our strategy as per the geographical areas and reports on vaccine hesitancy. For equitable assess, we did involve diverse collaborators, partnered with influencers and religious leaders for community education and confidence building. In order to prioritize the allocation, the Jammu Kashmir Immunization Department prepared a data-enabled solution for the targeted group which acted as a booth management strategy 
often seen during the elections. If today the priority groups in all districts are 100% vaccinated, it is because we were reached out to the people doorstep considering vaccination as a public service. Friends, the strategy does not exist in a vacuum. A carefully drafted strategy with boots on the ground has enormous potential for positive change in the community. And I always believe that the modern healthcare system is an essential prerequisite for every functioning society. Honorable Prime Minister has ensured that Jammu Kashmir has a well-developed human and institutional capacity in health sector. I shall give you two quick examples. As per National Family Health Survey report, neonatal mortal mortality rate in 15-16 was 23.1 per thousand. And in the last report, it came down to single digits of 9.8. Infant mortality rate was 32.4 in 15-16. And in the last report, it came down to 16.3. Under five mortality rate was 37.6 in 15-16. And in the latest report, it is 18.5. Since 1947 till 2014-15, Jammu Kashmir had only three medical colleges. Honorable Prime Minister Mr. Modi gave seven new medical colleges between 16 to 19. Jammu Kashmir received two AIMS, two cancer institutes under Prime Minister's development package. Ladies and gentlemen, you will be surprised to know that prior to 2018, there was no health insurance policy in Jammu and Kashmir. Honorable Prime Minister launched Ayushman Bharat Sehat scheme for all families of Jammu and Kashmir without any discrimination. In 2019, we had only 129 health and wellness centers across Jammu and Kashmir. Within two years, under the guidance of Honorable Prime Minister, we have opened 1375 new health and wellness centers. I think not only Jammu and Kashmir, but the entire world's growth and developmental model requires fulfillment of basic necessities of electricity, roads, and water. But unfortunately, despite having an estimated potential of 20,000 megawatt hydropower, Jammu Kashmir was able to harness only about 3,500 megawatt in the last seven decades. Some power projects were stuck for almost three decades. Within a few months, we launched the projects to harness additional 3,400 megawatt in just four to five years span. This new developmental model of implementation first announcement letter is aimed at making Jammu Kashmir self-reliant in the energy sector by 2025. For a number of years, not much attention was paid to upgradation of distribution and transmission infrastructure. We are now in the process of strengthening the existing system and projects are being completed at the faster pace. Friends, despite lapse of 75 years since independence, 974 villages were not connected with road network. Moreover, the speed of road construction per year was abysmally low, and it was just 707 kilometers in 1560. It increased more than four times with 3187 kilometers new roads constructed in the last year. In 2019, the topping of the road was 2290 kilometers in a year. In the last one year, we have black top more than 6,000 kilometers roads. As far as water is concerned, there was no scheme for potable drinking water for the entire population. Honorable Prime Minister has promised that by end of 2022, every household in Jammu and Kashmir will be connected with the tap water connection. Another important aspect of new growth in Jammu and Kashmir is for everyone to see development has replaced terror. Large turnout during the last year's District Development Council polls demonstrated people's belief in grassroots democracy and their urge to reap benefits of development that would come along with it. We had unveiled 
a new industrial scheme earlier this year that will offer 28,400 crores rupees, approximately 3.89 billion US dollar subsidy or incentive for attracting industrial investment. You will be surprised again because Jammu Kashmir was completely deprived of private invest investment since independence. Now we have received a proposal of 23,500 crore rupees or approximately 3.15 billion US dollars private investment. And by March next year, the number could go up to RS 50,000 crores rupees or approximately 6.5 billion US dollars. These examples speak volumes of structural changes that took place within Jammu and Kashmir in a very short span of time. I strongly believe in the words of 12th century Kashmiri historian Kalhan, who wrote in the famous Raj Tarangani, and I quote, a lost opportunity is considered equivalent to the three worlds. And this is what exactly had happened in the last 70 years. People were deprived of development, industries, good education, modern hospitals, infrastructure, and job opportunities. Let me compare the situation with two other states considered to be poor and backward. A state like Bihar has more than 11 crore or 110 million population, much more than 1 crore 30 lakh, that is 13 million population of Jammu Kashmir. But if you look at the population budget ratio, Jammu Kashmir receives more money every year than what Bihar gets. In 2021, Bihar state total budget was 2.1 lakh crore rupees, that is 26.58 billion US dollar. On the other hand, Jammu Kashmir budget was 1 lakh 8,000 crore rupees or 13.89 billion US dollar. UP has a population of more than 22 crores or 220 million population. And this year's budget was about 5.5 lakh crore rupees or approximately 65 billion US dollars. Even if we go back in the past, Jammu Kashmir total budget has been more or less the same. But the opportunity was lost due to complete absence of enabling ecosystem, which ultimately created massive disparity within the society. <coughs> the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic growth, environmental sustainability, and social in inclusion were completely missing. Regional aspirations were neglected and accumulation of growth happened at the hands of a few people. Due to lack of cohesive and integrated approach, socio-economic progress of all individuals of Union territory had become a dream. We are turning it now, we are turning it into a reality now. I have adopted targeted approach for the issues like poverty, nutrition, gender equality, quality education, the skill development of youth, and have ensured that benefits of government schemes reaches to the last mile for new distributed growth that is not limited to a select few in Srinagar and Jammu. Ladies and gentlemen, 70% population of Jammu Kashmir is dependent on agriculture and the light sectors. Horticulture exports have tremendous potential to grow and create more jobs. During the past one year, we have created an, an inclusive policy ecosystem for transforming Jammu Kashmir's agriculture and the light sectors to increase the income of our farmers, create jobs, ensure food security, and most importantly, getting people to move back to agriculture. The policy initiatives include high density apple plantation, new clusters of cold storages, setting up of farmer producer organizations in every district, promotion of intercropping, setting up of food processing units to boost the economy and enhance the contribution of agriculture and the light sectors to gross domestic products of the union territory. 
GI tagging has already been done for saffron of Kashmir, while the Basmati rice of Jammu has been given the organic certification. We also realized the dairy sector needed, needed a focused approach. With our integrated dairy development scheme, we are building entrepreneurship in this sector too. Since the last six months, UT is successfully producing 70 lakh liters milk per day, and I am confident within a year, Jammu Kashmir will become not only self-sufficient, but we will produce more milk. I want the youth of Jammu and Kashmir to view agriculture and allied activities as a viable profession, and I will leave no stone unturned to make it a reality. Since the need of the hour is a massive upliftment of every potent sectors and employment, the government focuses on IPS, identity, productivity, and security. 1900 British scientist Lord Kelvin <clears throat> while addressing a gathering at the British Association of the Advancement of Science made a statement and I quote there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now all that remains is more and more precise measurement Fortunately or unfortunately, he died in 1907, precisely 16 years before the world of science was second by Albert Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. Just imagine what Lord Kelvin might have done to himself if he was alive in 1923. When I first came here in August 2020, people were making some similar prophecy. Youth will never get a job. Economy will always be in tatters. Women, women will never be empowered. And many more such comments were passed by merchants of doubt. So instead of prescriptions given to us by some so-called experts, we step, to, step forward to provide identity to women and youth through enhanced engagement for increased productivity and socioeconomic security. People often ask why women and youth engagement is important for society and the nation. My answer is very simple. And I say, always being the same that they are foundation of our indigenous growth. Our union territory has more than 69% population below the age of 35 years. This young energy, the vibrant human capital is our biggest asset that will contribute immensely in at least 58 sectors if they can be suitably tapped with skill. From agriculture, apparel, infrastructure, tourism, information technology, services, automobiles, telecom, finance, entertainment, retail, hospitality, startups, self-help groups, to the brand new sectors like robotics and artificial intelligence and other exponential technologies would witness around 25% the skilled workforce in India. It is also a golden hour for Jammu Kashmir to fill the sectoral gaps and with the help of a strong, flexible and modern skilling system to ensure livelihood for every household and socio-economic security for marginalized sections of the society. For a deeper engagement on social security, we are making every panchayat a self-sustainable and self-sufficient economic unit. When I look at the youth in Jammu and Kashmir today, I find four qualities which are actually shaping our development journey, and that is spontaneity, leadership quality, adaptability, and capability. Within six months, we have 20,000 youth entrepreneurs spread across all 4239 panchayats. Of these, approximately 4,600 are young girls. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand the underlying fact that it is not just about creating a single job. A typical small unit in a panchayat can create employment for a minimum four or five people. At the current rate, we are hopeful of converting our young population into assets. And I have no hesitation in saying that if young generation in UT has gripped the soul of new Jammu and Kashmir, it is because 
of their new ideas, new innovations, and quest for doing something extraordinary. They are, all, they are inherently talented in order to quench their thirst and make them partner of governance. So we started youth clubs in every panchayat. The members are well-educated, professionals, social workers, students who will act as a bridge between the administration and the community. No doubt, there are also challenges of unemployment for highly qualified. Due to lack of industries and private sector, the only available option was government jobs. And because of this number of government employees in Jammu Kashmir is around 5 lakhs. Given our modest population, the government is obviously bloated. That's why we have adopted domestic population-centric policy to create at least 1 million employment opportunities and support them through an enabling ecosystem. I have adopted a multi-pronged strategy involving all necessary systematic interventions. We are focusing on six broader areas through a program Mission Youth, which will focus on livelihood generation, education, skill development, career counseling, financial assistance, and recreation, including sports and entertainment. The intent is to provide a vibrant medium for engagement of youth into ambassadors of peace and development. And we have already started several schemes like Hosla, Mumkin, Parvaj, LG Scholarship, LG Super 75, who meet with the appropriate and adequate infrastructure. I must confess the most disturbing factor for me was consistent fall in economic participation of women. We have tried to offset that situation with more progressive policies to address environmental constraints they face. With the help of digital revolution, we are empowering women at all levels. And I can proudly say we have added 4 lakh women in rural self-help groups. And with Pan Jammu Kashmir artisan mapping, we are very much hopeful of revolutionizing women grassroots entrepreneurs. You shall be surprised to know that wide spectrum of heritage skills encoded in Jammu Kashmir's DNA was not appreciated. In order to create a fine balance between supply-oriented approach and demand-driven skill, we have come out with a minimum support price for Pasmina and many other initiatives to provide access to the global market. This is happening for the first time in the history of UT. We are hoping to generate more employment opportunities for youth and women in traditional craft and also nurture an ecosystem that will strengthen our culture. According to International Finance Corporation study, the rejection rate for women application for bank loans in India is 2.5 times higher than that for men. But we have defied this national trend in Jammu and Kashmir and ensured 910 crore rupees or approximately 154 million US dollars bank credit for women entrepreneurs, which is higher than that of men in UT. Ladies and gentlemen, during the trying times of COVID-19 pandemic, I am always reminded of American architect Fuller, Buck Mensah Fuller, that the planet is essentially a giant spaceship, a one-town world. He has been echoing the ancient Indian wisdom of Vasudev Kutumbakam, the world is a family and our future may still be one in which we eliminate poverty, ensure growth and social security while tackling the bedrocks of governance through people-friendly reforms. If Jammu Kashmir is seeing a new dawn in different sectors. The credit also goes to reforms in outdated crumbling and regressive systems. We have established one nation, one constitution, one flag and one market by applying all 89 central laws to Jammu Kashmir, repealing 205 unjust discriminatory laws and modifying 130 existing laws. The central laws for the first time in the history of Jammu Kashmir are providing forest rights to tribals, rights to children, 
to free and compulsory education, prevention of atrocities against weaker sections, protection to farmers to create new orchards, rights to displaced persons from Pakistan occupied Jammu Kashmir, West Pakistani refugees and Kashmiri migrants. For the first time, there is unprecedented accountability and transparency in the system. With the help of digital evolution and e-file system, the administrative role has been transformed into service-oriented one. The implementation framework based on C, speed, efficiency, effectiveness, and delivery has helped us to create a roadmap to achieve the deliverables. While assessing the challenges and resource management for a vibrant Jammu Kashmir, we always discuss the defined vision and goal for the UT. In my overreaching themes for new Jammu and Kashmir, priorities are clear, distributed growth model, better health facilities, skilled youth population, empowered women, prosperous farmers, and transforming this soil as a powerhouse of education and science. Ladies and gentlemen, despite all the challenges, we keep encountering unity in diversity. Shared values drawn from Vedas, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, concept of duties is our greatest system. There is an ancient saying in India that if the goal is in sight, one more step and success is yours. As the Lieutenant Governor of Jammu Kashmir, my topmost priority is to ensure development opportunities for all. The potential of each individual is harnessed in a way that everyone contributes towards the prosperity of this union country and the country. I must mention here that the conflict and the human tragedy sweeping through South Asia needs to be tackled with the solid international cooperation so that young generation do not fall victim to radical ideology. The influences, the influencers and decision makers in the society should remember that peace will remain a crucial requirement for development and stability. Finally, I would like to express my sincere gratitude for affording me today the honor of speaking to you. Such deliberations are important to save policies and set priorities for a peaceful tomorrow. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for such a reassuring remarks. I'm sure all the audience uh, would go satisfied that Jammu Kashmir is moving on the right track and is in the right hands. In fact, uh, this could have been the best finale to this uh, two-year session. And now to speak uh, to us, uh, to make his special remarks, may I request uh, Mani Ramadavji. Uh, Ra Mani Ramadav is a thinker politician and uh, he is currently a member of the Governing Council of uh, India Foundation. He has written several books. He writes frequently for newspapers, websites, travels across the globe giving lectures. And uh, his recent book, Because India Comes First, Reflections on Nationalism, Identity and Culture came this year itself. And another book is now in the pipeline. Uh, without wasting much time, I'll request now Sri Ram Madhavji to address the gathering. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me at the outset uh, uh, thank His Excellency, the Lieutenant Governor of uh, Jammu and Kashmir for gracing this occasion and uh, giving such a wonderfully detailed uh, uh, analysis of uh, the developmental activity taking place under his able and uh, dynamic and visionary guidance. As uh, Captain Alok Bansal mentioned, there could not have been a better finale for this two-day very significant uh, uh, conference about uh, the development trajectory of the newly created Union territory of, uh, Territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. After such a wonderfully detailed presentation by His Excellency Lieutenant Governor, there is actually really nothing much left for anybody to add. Uh, so I don't have to take much time of yours in the last two days. Almost all the important dimensions of uh, the development activity of the two union territories have been discussed in detail through various sessions. Jammu and Kashmir used to be presented to the world audience 
as a as a region of conflict region of dispute uh, but uh, india has always maintained that jammu and kashmir is an integral part of our country we always maintained that kashmir is ours but when we said that kashmir is ours what we meant was not just that the kashmir territory was ours what we meant was that every kashmiri is ours today after listening to his excellency the lieutenant governor every one of us must have realized that at the center of our entire governance at the center of our entire developmental trajectory is the ordinary citizen of kashmir how he is his well being his prosperity his development is made the central focus of governance is what we heard from his excellency right now that has been the entire endeavor of this government and uh, one very important uh, or very significant achievement in the last few years has been the uh, the democratization of the political process in the union territory now for the first time in so many decades grassroots democracy has been given a new lease of life under the present dispensation india has had a three tier uh, uh, governance system at the local levels it's called the village level block level and district level this is in addition to the provincial level legislatures and the national parliament unfortunately for many decades the people of kashmir have been denied the democracy at the grassroots the power used to be controlled by the legislators and the members of the national parliament but in the last few years very assiduous efforts were made to take democracy to the grassroots as his excellency ng has uh, mentioned today uh, over 20000 active legis uh, active members are running the local bodies at the village level at the block level and the district level and the significant achievement of the the jammu and kashmir administration was to provide these local democratic bodies three fs fund function and functionary this is very important it is happening for the first time as far as i know only in jammu and kashmir there the lowest administrative unit the lowest uh, village administrative unit is now being democratically elected it is getting required funding financial support it is also getting certain powers administrative powers in the form of functions and it is also getting the power to have its own officials in the form of functionaries i think under the dynamic leadership of the lg and the administration of the uh, union territory jammu and kashmir stands out in india today uh, as one of the most functional grassroots democracies that i think is one of the big achievements of uh, the government apart from many other achievements that honorable lg and many others in the last two days have enumerated i congratulate the organizers of uh, the two day conference the vivekananda cultural center in seoul uh, under the uh, embassy of seoul under the dynamic leadership of our ambassador there and also the two partnering uh, organizations in india the india foundation and the jammu and kashmir study center for successfully completing this conference i must uh, also mention here that very rarely do we get uh, such very high profile stakeholders to speak directly about uh, the jammu kashmir issue even in india sometimes we fail to get both the lgs in one conference so i must really congratulate the organizers for uh, the success in uh, bringing all such high profile stakeholders to share their thoughts with uh, the eminent participants Uh, let me end here thank you and best wishes thank you ram madhav ji uh, for such a wonderful 
remarks. I'll now request Sri Dinesh Patnayak, uh, who is Director General of Indian Council for Cultural Relations, New Delhi, to speak. He's a career diplomat with over 30 years of experience in variety of diplomatic assignments. He has served in the Indian missions in Geneva, Dhaka, Beijing, and Vienna, and has handled various appointments uh, at Ministry of External Affairs. And uh, he's right now the Director General of Indian Council of Cultural Relations. Over to you, Mr. Knight, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Namaskar to everybody. Um, it was delightful listening to Manoj Joshiji. <clears throat> I've always been a big fan of him. And now finding him taking the helm of affairs in Jammu Kashmir, I'm confident that things will be very, very good there. Uh, this is a wonderful symposium. And I'm glad that uh, India Foundation, JNK Study Center, and ICCR and the embassy have worked together to set up this symposium. And in the last yesterday and today, they've discussed various issues uh, from security to gender and social justice, um, developmental models, everything that we needed to discuss about what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir today. And right now with Manoj Joshi ji giving a complete worldview of what is happening in JNK, uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud of the work he's doing and really delighted that such things are happening now. Because for the first time in many years, the focus of the administration in Jammu and Kashmir is on development and progress rather than politics and political games. So I'm delighted that this is what has happened today. Uh, previous speakers, I've listened to previous speakers and they've spoken on various issues. But for me, from when I hear of all these speakers, from when I hear Manoj Joshi ji, when I hear Ram Adak ji, all of them, I come down to the basic thing that there are two things we need to focus on. One is the trust factor. Whatever we may say or do over the past many years, we have lost trust in each other. And I'm not just talking about one side, it's all sides. So the question is that we need to bring back the trust on both sides. And the trust can happen when both sides realize that there is a deep desire among all stakeholders, especially the administration in Jammu and Kashmir, to see progress and development in JNK. You know, once you get to understand that actually the administration is looking not to rule, but to uh, serve the people and to bring progress and development, trust factors come in. Not just progress and development economically, but also socioculturally. This is very important because I, you know, many people have discussed different things. I want to bring it down to what ICCR does best, which is cultural diplomacy, because this is where I see where the heart of Jammu and Kashmir and the entire region lies. This region, which is Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, has a huge cultural heritage. I mean, this is one of the most vibrant cultural regions of the world, not just of India. It resembles India at its best. It is an amalgamation of multiple cultural strands and influences, which has created this great mosaic of this region. You know, you've got every kind of cultural influence that is there in this region. It is at the crossroads of civilization where every kind of civilization has moved across and left its best in this area. And so this great cultural vibrancy, the strong social bonds that the society in Jammu and Kashmir has and the outstanding literary traditions, these are something which we need to nurture because this is permeated into the soul of the region. When you see India, you see Jammu and Kashmir because this is what like uh, Manoj Joshi he said that Sadar Patel said, whatever happened in Jammu and Kashmir has a great influence on the rest of India. But this is always the true the other way around. Jammu and Kashmir led India in showing how a multicultural society can behave and put together. You know, the, both the Rishi tradition and the Sufi tradition, there's people actually moved across each other, went to each other's shrines, prayed at each other's temples and mosques and everywhere. This was a country, this was a place of great cultural tradition and we need to do it. And they've got everything. They've got oral histories. They've got great native art and crafts. They've written gems, the musical talent, philosophical moorings, you name everything. Whether you look at textiles, colorful clothes, carpets, the rugs called namdas, brilliant namdas. I mean, I have namdas in my house that absolutely brilliant stuff. Handicrafts is outstanding. And I'm, I was very happy to hear what Manu Joshi J said about encouraging artisans to do well. Uh, sir, you need to do two more things. One is not just giving incentives, but also giving designs. Because uh, Jammu and Kashmir has been stuck in a place where the designs have been the same design they've been doing for the last 30, 40, 50 years. The world is looking at new designs, new things. So 
design is an element which most of these artisans need and if we can provide that that would be wonderful but the two things that are very important there is music music is in the very soul of this region this region is musically very talented every house you go to jammu and kashmir in this area music is part of the tradition and there's a strong influence the central asian influence in instruments and in musical scale so you have the dukra you have the sitar you have the nagara and you have the santur i mean today the santur is worldwide and these are instruments which are right now even being used all over central asia so whether you go to uzbekistan kazakhstan tajikistan the whole area right up to turkey right up to the middle east everywhere these are the instruments so why don't we sir have an international music festival and conference bringing together international musicians from across the world to not only play the instruments but to have a festival in jammu and kashmir which actually brings together these traditions with jammu and kashmir the linkages that this area has with countries across the world there are great sufi traditions sufi music traditions you know sacred music festivals these are these are things we need to do because jammu and kashmir has a development thing which you are working very hard on but if you revive the soul of jammu and kashmir the culture of jammu and kashmir this is what will bring jammu and kashmir back to its old greatness not just sacred music festival this is a modern music festival there are so many things the youth of today and this comes down to the other one youth of today need this music is part of every youngsters tradition and if you bring music to them and show their music to the world and bring new world music to them this is something we'll be doing a great thing in jammu and kashmir uh, you have done a great thing sir by encouraging bollywood to come and shoot not just bollywood every uh, film jammu and kashmir at one time used to be the place where every film maker wanted to go and shoot the world used to want to come there so you are reviving that tradition and i'm delighted because that is the other point i wanted to say is that that is one thing which is also very critical to the growth back not only of the culture but also of tourism which is a very intrinsic part of what jammu kashmir is to the world but the last point i wanted to make is the literary traditions in jammu and kashmir for some strange reason we have not looked at the literary tradition this is the land of great literary poets uh, last year uh, iccr was actually discussing with a lot of people in jammu and kashmir to celebrate the 700th year of laleshwari sir uh, lal ded was uh, born in 1320 sir 700 years ago and we wanted to celebrate 700 years of laleshwari unfortunately covid did not allow us to do that but so she was the great mystic poet sir who started the whole kashmiri tradition of music and even the kashmiriyat what you call today is actually comes from laleshwari and this is the area sir which is great poets whether it's haba khatun nand rishi or this is a place where the patanjali wrote his yoga sutras where the bharat and natya shastra was written the greatest treatises on dance and music now, all these things so this is a literary uh, greats have all come from this place and this is the life where the nilmata purana the kashmiri mahatmaya was written you you name say anything we can so why are we not doing an international literary festivals so today literary festivals across the world are places where people discuss the literary traditions of the country what my point is sir is music festivals literary festivals cultural festivals not only open up jammu and kashmir to the world but bring the world to jammu and kashmir when youngsters when artists when uh, writers and authors and others feel connected to the world you actually are bringing back the resurgence of jammu and kashmir so these are things i wanted to say uh, this was a great symposium i would like to thank my friend shripriya ranganathan who is the ambassador in south korea for the wonderful initiative they have taken when she called me up about some months back saying that we would like iccr to be part of this i said iccr is always part of every embassy you don't have to ask to be part of this we are all there and uh, we are here to celebrate not only uh, this symposium but also celebrate the fact that we have moved ahead so much on this region this region has a lot to offer not only to india but to the world and i can see that at the under the able leadership of manoj joshi ji and the kind of people who have in this panel today we have a very bright future thank you very much and it's a wonderful symposium thanks to all the people who have been part of the symposium i can see alok bansal ji from the jnk study center ram madhav ji from india foundation and sonu uh, trivedi from the swami vivekananda center and shri priyanka thank you very much everybody and namaskar thank you mr patnaik uh, now i'll just request uh, shri jawarlal kolji
who is the president jammu kashmir study center a padma shri awardi a veteran journalist who started his career with hindustan samachar agency and has worked with times group dinman indian express and jansatta to give his concluding remarks over to you sir you need to unmute yourself sir yeah thank you theek hai yes perfect can you hear me now yes sir. we can hear you sir thank you alok ji for asking me to say a few words in conclusion of this two day conference this conference has provided us an opportunity an occasion to watch and participate in deep churning of the useful suggestions about jammu and kashmir and ladakh there is there is no doubt that jammu and kashmir and ladakh region is unique in entire world not because of its geography only but also in the variety of communities with different origins and histories in fact the story of the rise of himalayas from its ancient ancient sea millions of years ago is also the story of birth of jammu and kashmir and many other uh, valleys rivers highland pastures and lakes associated with the great mountain range it's not surprising that the the story of the tribes of this region and the scores of the human community communities start from the earliest developmental phase of human civilization in holy past thousands of years before the prevalent christian era started it is natural that it is very difficult to define the developing models and devise future strategies in regions where some historians are still busy in discussing questions like who lived in kashmir valley before the people of the punjab and slopes of himalayan settled here or who populated ladakh dardas mounas pishachas or mongols in different sessions of this conference many scholars have thrown sufficient light on various aspects of several and several new facts have been revealed some useful suggestions presented we have seen many positive changes in the past few years but to set to set the jammu and kashmir on right track we need to involve 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 the common people to create a vision of their own future they have to think about their themselves they have to start thinking about their future it is fortunate that several of our speakers are natives of this region in question or or persons associated with this development developmental process process apart from professor kashinath pandita we had occasion to listen to shakti munshi uh, and shri ram madhav ji who have been closely related with the jammu and kashmir and its political development in recent years of course the honorable manoj manoj sinha ji my old friend a dynamic lieutenant governor of jammu and kashmir and has ushered in new changes at least in last couple of years there have been many changes in jammu and kashmir things probably 
nobody would have imagined decades ago. I, being in uh, Kashmiri myself, born in uh, one of the remotest areas of Ladakh in Skardu, and started my education in Muzaffarabad, that is Azad Kashmir, was part of the all the good and bad that has happened to the Muslim Kashmir. I had never imagined that Kashmir can ever be uh, feeling the importance of the democracy. Of course, the ballot has come to Jammu and Kashmir long before it came to the rest of the states. Even before assemblies and parliament was ever conceived, Jammu Kashmir had some sort of an assembly which was with an elected people which advised the king and the government. But Bullet replaced it soon. Since uh, in the last uh, two days, we have heard so many um, vibrant ideas. We have um, those who are related to Jammu and Kashmir have expressed or presented before uh, the um, goods and bads of Jammu and Kashmir administration and the people in, in a detailed manner. We have seen the uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, giving a detailed description of what's actually happening in Jammu and Kashmir in the last few years. Therefore, I don't have to give a lecture. Um, as a president of Jammu and Kashmir, it is my only um, duty to thank you all. Uh, thank you, sir. I think, uh, thank you for uh, these notes. Uh, we have already overshot the time. So without wasting much time, I'll just request Dr. Sonu Trivedi, uh, Director of Swami Vivekanand Cultural Center, Seoul, to just propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, C Captain Bansal, uh, yeah, for uh, uh, presiding over this session. Let us now give a great round of applause to all our most valued dignitaries, Excellency, Sri uh, Manoj Sinhaji, the Honorable uh, Lieutenant Governor of Jammu and Kashmir, and also to Excellency uh, Sri Radha Krishna Mathurji, uh, Honorable Lieutenant Governor of Ladakh, who joined us yesterday in the inaugural session, Sri Ram Madhavji, Sri uh, Dinesh K. Patnayakji, Sri Jawahar uh, Lal Kaulji, Captain Alok Bansalji, and to all speakers joining from India and Republic of Korea on both the days along with all other invited guests and friends of India in Republic of Korea for uh, joining us here for uh, these two days. Well, friends, various issues have been discussed in the interactive sessions and provocative lectures and presentations by experts and scholars from India and Korea. These have varied from hard security issues to issues such as social security and gender equity as well, from unique socio-cultural ethos to new growth developmental models. We've also heard from both the excellencies, uh, Lieutenant Gov uh, Governor of Jammu and Kashmir and um, from uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Ladakh about the new initiatives and developmental projects. I'm sure the Korean experience of growth and development may carry some le less lessons and open the way forward for many more collaborations in future. We are also thankful to all the speakers for their scholarly presentations and moderators for presiding over the sessions. I would request all the presenters to share um, uh, the transcripts, uh, the edited version of their transcripts so that we may compile them and put them together in an edited volume to be shared with the larger public. I'm sure the team um, of all the partners would work on this together. Friends, organizing such a conference requires meticulous planning and close coordination for working out all the details. And for this, we are thankful to the team of Institute of East and West Studies at Yonsei University in Republic of Korea, along with the team of India Foundation and Jammu Kashmir Study Center in India for collaborating 
and working together in organizing this two-day international symposium. Special thanks to Indian Council for Cultural Relations for providing all guidance and support. At this moment, I would like to acknowledge the dynamic leadership of the main pillar of our embassy and the cultural center, Ambassador of India, Her Excellency Sri Priya Ranganathan. Thank you, ma'am, for conceptualizing the idea and for all your encouragement and support for such endeavors. We've also been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues at the Embassy of India and team of Swami Vivekanand Cultural Center. I extend my sincere thanks to them for their enormous support in organizing this symposium and providing all logistics and technical support. And also special thanks to both our interpreters for simultaneous uh, interpretation and making the entire exercise more meaningful. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to all the live participants who have joined us on both the days. We are here, friends, because you are here. Stay tuned to our social media handles for more updates about the upcoming events. Thank you, Hamza Hamnida. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.